podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Hi, this is Leo Laporte, and this is my Tech Guy podcast. This show originally aired on the Premier Networks on Sunday, May 2nd, 2021. This is episode 1793. Enjoy. The Tech Guy Podcast is brought to you by Simply Safe. Get simple professional monitoring day and night. Right now, customize your system and get a free security camera. It also includes a 60-day risk-free trial when you go to simplysafe.com slash twit. Well, hey, 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 how are you today? Leo Laporte here. The Tech Guy, time to talk computers and the internet Home theater, digital photography, smartphones, smartwatches, electric vehicles, augmented reality, giant tech companies, small little startups, all of the things we talk about on this show. 8888 Ask Leo. If it's got a chip in it, if it's technology, then uh, we'll talk about it. 888 827 5536. Toll free from anywhere in the US or Canada. Outside that area, uh, well, you can still call, but you got to use Skype or something like that. You can't just dial up a... can't go get your uh, Western Electric phone and ch -ch 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 dial it up. Ch -ch -ch -ch. No, you need some sort of magical internet technology. But if you've got that, it should be toll-free. 8888 ask Leo. Now, everything I say will show up on the website. Thanks to James DeRuvar, scribe. It's techguylabs.com. That's free. There's no charge. There's not even any sign-up. You just go on in there and participate. TechGuyLabs.com. Uh, that's the place to go. And I, I tell you that now so you don't feel like, oh, I got to write this down. No, you don't have to. It'll all be there. It'll all be there. Boy, was this a good year. We're starting to see the, uh, the results from the previous quarter from companies like Apple and Google and Microsoft. And it was a, phew, it was a good, it was a good 2020. The combined yearly revenue of Amazon, Apple, Microsoft, and Facebook, and Alphabet, which is Google. So that's A-A-A-M-F of the FAM. Facebook, Apple, Amazon, Alphabet, and Microsoft FAM. Combined yearly revenue, $1.2 trillion, with a T, dollars. And that's growth overall of 25% since the pandemic started. If you take those five companies, in, in less than a week, they made more money than McDonald's does in a year. Not profit revenue. Profit's pretty, pretty darn good, too. In fact, Apple reported a 42% profit margin for the last quarter. That's astounding. <laughs> that's... That just shows you uh, Apple products, they've historically been very expensive. Well, 42% of that is going into the pockets. Uh, well, and it's not staying there because Apple also announced another big share buyback. They buy back their stock. That's how they keep that stock flying high. Uh, Google does that. They, uh, they all do it now. Apple, I think, was one of the first to really first big tech company to really do that. Apple for years didn't even offer a dividend on their stock. Now they say, we're going to buy back $80 billion, $80 billion, $80 billion in stock. Yikes. Pretty amazing when you look at these quarterly numbers in, as in aggregate. These companies are incredibly profitable. You know, and I think that that also stimulates uh, scrutiny from... Uh, the rest of us going, wow, they, they did pretty well in the pandemic. How did, how did we all do? Not so well. Uh, they did all pretty well. Yeah. Uh, and so, and of course, Congress and European Union and others, European Union is launching an investigation of Apple's app store. Say, uh, there, <laughs> there, there was a story came out uh, this week. I mentioned Apple's 42% profit margin. You no, know, Apple's in a, a big lawsuit with Epic Games, uh, and of course, it's also about the App Store. But a lot of, lot, you know, governments and private companies, Spotify, uh, Epic Games, which makes Fortnite. They all, they all say Apple's using its monopoly to to gouge us, and by extension, to gouge users. Epic Games had an expert witness 
examining documents, and he came up with an astounding number that the App Store operating margins, this is the percent profit in 2019, was 78%. 78% profit. <laughs> That's a big number. Apple disputes it. Not only do they dispute it, but they're asking the judge to, uh, hey, Your Honor, can we restrict public discussion of App Store profit? <laughs> the mon mon tomorrow the trial begins. Can we, uh, Your Honor, <laughs> it's kind of embarrassing. Could we not talk about that, please? Now, I don't know if 78% is accurate, you know, because Apple won't say, and this is just some independent expert who is working for the other side. But if it's even close... Overall, 42% margin in their overall business, 78% in the App Store. Wow. No wonder they don't want to change things. That's a, quite a windfall. Speaking of change, you know, people are coming back from a pandemic. They're coming back to work. Google, ever wacky. They are in Northern California. Ever wacky. Article in the New York Times today. Uh, about Google's plan for the future of work, which includes privacy robots and balloon walls. <laughs> okay, that was a headline. I, I that, that was link bait. I had to, what? For line what? Private what? You know, Google's always had great amenities for its employees. You know, there were bicycles outside of every uh, building. I've ridden them, multicolored bicycles that uh, you can ride around. There were segways. They, you know, they had free meals in every building and all kinds of different restaurants. I mean, there, it was really amazing the kinds of meals you could get at Google. But that was kind of par for the course for Silicon Valley. That's, you know, that wasn't anything unusual. This is a little unusual. <laughs> this is a little more wacky. So uh, the new workspaces, as people come back to work, uh will and they're you know not all of them are going to be this way but they're trying out stuff see they have a google uh, i guess all big companies probably have this but they have people in charge of the environment you know what the working space and uh, they come up with stuff sociologists and psychologists and designers so they're gonna <laughs> there, there's all kinds of they're Instead of rows, I'm reading from the New York Times article, instead of rows of desks next to cookie cutter meeting rooms, every office building you've ever seen, Google is designing team pods. Each pod is, is a blank canvas. It's, you know, do what you want with it. It's got chairs, desks, whiteboards, and storage units, but they're all on casters. So you can roll them around, make it any way uh, your team wants. They have new meeting room concepts uh, like Campfire, which has lots of unfinished plywood and <laughs> in a circle and <laughs> there's also campsites uh at this is in uh, mountain view at the headquarters pretty nice weather most of the time so they've converted a parking lot and lawn area into what they call camp charleston a fenced in mix of grass and wooden deck flooring about the size of four tennis courts there's of course high speed internet throughout wi-fi Clusters of Adirondack chairs and tables under open-air tents. In larger teepees, there are meeting... <laughs> yes, teepees. Who knew you'd be going to work for a uh, multinational, multi-trillion dollar conglomerate uh, and working in a teepee. Meeting areas with the decor of a California nature retreat and state-of-the-art video conferencing equipment. Each tent has a camp theme named Kindling, S'mores canoe let's all get together in camp canoe and discuss the quarterly results from fiscal year 2020 what do you say they've been doing this since march google's also going to build outdoor workspaces like this in london be a little less pleasant i think los angeles nice munich mm. new york and sydney you can't go you won't have a permanent desk it'll be a rotation so you'll be assigned to come into your desk on a specific day to ensure that, quote, no one is there on the same day as your immediate neighbors. <laughs> if You know, the pictures uh, are, are even better. 
The pictures are even better. I highly recommend this New York Times article. You won't believe it. The funniest thing, and they have an animated uh, GIF of this in the uh, in the article on the web. If the meeting requires privacy, a robot, yes, a robot, that looks like the innards of a computer on wheels and is equipped with sensors to detect its surroundings comes over to, I don't know if there's anybody driving it or if it does it automatically, but it sounds like it's somewhat automatic, comes over, the robot comes over and inflates a translucent cellophane wall to keep prying eyes uh, away. But you've got to see the image because... <laughs> It's this. It's it, it's kind of like the pod people. It's a little scary, to be honest with you. The inflatable balloon wall that wheels into place because everything's open plan. So <laughs> I, I I could go on, but I I'm out of time. There's just so much weird stuff. So much weird stuff. And it's all, you know, designed around teleconferencing, too. And that's the thing that's interesting to me is how life has changed. You know, I think as we get out of pandemic, at least in the U.S. anyway, thanks to a very aggressive vaccine schedule, we're getting there. Uh, everybody thinks, well, it's just going to go back to the way it was. It ain't. It ain't. It's going to be different. And some of the things that we got used to will be very different. Very, very different balloon walls and campsites and all that stuff. Worth reading just for the illustrations. I, I read it for the pictures. Yeah, the Florida law, which will be immediately struck down in court because I think there's a thing, I'm, I might be wrong, but I think there's a thing called the First Amendment, which says government shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech. And it sounds to me if like if Twitter wants to ban President You Know Who, he who shall not be named, that Twitter should have the right to do that as a private company and government shall make no law. Florida. Government? Well, sort of. Not the best government. But government shall make no law. Is Florida bound by the United States Constitution? Yes. Yes, they are. Yes. Yes, they are. Yeah, it's also interstate commerce. Hey, there's another good one. So now there's two reasons you can strike it down. Interstate commerce, Florida has no control thereof. And there is that, you know, little pesky thing called the First Amendment. 18, 4, 7, 4, see, that's not our number. <laughs> 5, 5, 5, 1, 2, 1, 2. It's not our number either. Our <laughs> yeah. number, 800. Don't call either of those numbers. You I mean, won't get through. 888. <laughs> Eight six seven five. No, no. Our, our number is eight 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 two seven five five three six. Somebody should make a song with that number in it. Everybody else we need has a band. Got, yeah. Hello, Kim Schaffer, Phone Angel. Hello. How are you? I'm good. Happy Sunday. It's beautiful outside. It is going to be a beautiful day. Beautiful week. It's Ninety-one degrees on Friday in Orange County. Ninety-one. It felt like. 91 here a yeah. couple days ago. <laughs> well, it's good you cut some holes in your clothing. I know. That's, you'll get some air. You got to do that. got to do right? that. Just get some air in there. <laughs> a little air conditioning. <laughs> oh, teasing me. Or just come here and hang out. Because we have a little AC. We a little, have way too much. It's a little much. cold in here sometimes. Studios, Perfect right now, though. Studios are frequently overcooled mm. because uh, you don't lights. want to see me sweating on the show. <laughs> That's not a that. attractive. Always kept the studio cold. So who should I talk to here? Uh, let's go somewhere warm. Orlando. Sunday. Deep. Ah, we've Line talked to Sundeep before. <laughs> Thank you, Kim. Hello, Sundeep. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hey, Leo. Thanks for taking my call. Thanks for calling. Uh, I just had a question about um, what's the right upload and download speeds. Right now, I have uh, 60 megabytes up and down for internet speed. I can upgrade to 100 up and down uh, for $15 more, or I can go to another company and get up to 400 down and about 40 up. So I it's kind of amazing, isn't it? Uh, you know, it, 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 when it comes to technology, bigger numbers are always better, right? <laughs> except for, except mm -hmm. for benchmarks. But uh, bigger numbers, even sometimes with benchmarks, bigger numbers are always better. So you just say, well, give me all the bandwidth you got. How much do you got? And, and what does happen, I have to say, is your usage might change as you get more bandwidth. You know, when you have uh, 40... You can't 
all watch your own Netflix show. You can't have Junior in the bedroom watching YouTube. Uh, you're watching Netflix in the living room. Somebody's uh, watching, uh, you know, cooking videos in the kitchen. You can't do that because you just you, you're sharing it. So, but on the other hand, you get used to it. And you say, "Hey, I'm, I'm gonna let's all watch a movie together." <laughs> so you you eliminate that. Uh, you have something kind of unusual with your current provider. You have what's called symmetric internet. Typically, from time immemorial, internet service providers have assumed that you're going to do more downloading than you're going to do uploading. So they give you a higher download number than an upload number. That's why that other company you're thinking of going to is 440. 400 is the download speed, and that's what you're using for Netflix and everything else. But we do a surprisingly large amount of uploading these days uh, for a variety of reasons. It's not just uploads to websites, but uh, there's a lot of data coming out of your system you probably don't need more than 40. For instance, if you're using Zoom or Skype, nowadays, if you've got a kid going, two kids going to school on Zoom during the day and, and uh, mom's at work on, uh, on uh, Microsoft Teams, you know, 40 is probably going to be stressed. So uh, the upstream is fairly important. So you're lucky you have a symmetric internet connection right now that's giving you a very good upstream. And 100 100 would be really amazing. So you have to kind of figure out what's more important to you. Um, and that, that really depends on how you're using it. Is it just you? It's just me, but when I have, like, friends over, I, I see what you're saying. Uh, like, right now I have 60, and if they have, if they bring their kids over, you know, people are doing, they play games, you know, online games, then you can tell yeah. the down, like, yeah. getting that. And where it hits is um, is on voice calls because nowadays many cell phones use the Wi-Fi for, for cell phone calls, uh, Zoom calls, video calls. And, and so we're doing so much more of that that's become more of a concern than it used to be, which is why this whole asymmetric Internet, this this imbalance between up and down is kind of old fashioned. It didn't it didn't think you were going to be streaming so much content out of your house. So that's what you have to figure out is, you know, how much upstream do I need? Uh, you can go. Netflix has a page, and I'm. Uh, this doesn't. You don't have to be a Netflix subscriber to. This is just kind of relevant if you Google Netflix bandwidth requirements. They have a page that I think is fairly accurate for everything, and they say the minimum. <laughs> if you wanted to watch standard quality on Netflix, the minimum would be. Uh, believe it or not, this is hard to believe. One point five megabits. That. In my experience, is is yes, very minimum. For standard definition, they say three megabits. For high definition, five megabits. This is your download, and for 4K, 25. I would double all of those. But even with with 50, you're good to watch a single UHD stream on Netflix or Amazon Prime or anywhere, you know. But uh, that's just one. So again, it depends. You know, you don't have kids, so you, that kind of makes that easier for you. I like a lot of download speed. Uh, you know, I have a, my um, home internet has a, I really find it handy, a thing that tells me how much of the capacity I've used. And I rarely go above 200. So 440 would probably be fine. Um, but 100 to 100 is, is probably fine too. It's really up to how you use it. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Is it a lot more expensive for 440? Uh, right now I pay $45 for 6060. Um, if I go to a hundred, it'd be $60. But if I, that's, that's, but if I go to uh, spectrum charter, it would be 55 for 400 for the asymmetric. Yeah. And yeah. the other thing, so what do you have this, this hundred, hundred, hundred is really interesting or 6060. Who is it? DSL. Who's it can't be DSL. It must be fiber. No, it's, it's uh yeah it's it's toast.net they're an AT&T enterprise account. Oh, interesting. Um, to, yeah, it, if you go to toast. Is it fiber? You know. Yeah. Yeah. It, yeah, it'd it have to be fiber. Fiber is often symmetric. Yeah, that's really good. Fiber is often symmetric um because uh, they can. <laughs> and if you're fancy enough to have fiber, you might be fancy enough to be using the uh, upstream. Uh, now, that's the other thing to consider from... is your reliability might be higher with a fiber connection. In other words, a 100-100 fiber connection 
might be better than a cable 440. Um, I see. Because it's consistently 100. Uh, because it's a business... Well, it, they, this is a, it, it's residential, right? Residential service? Yes. Yeah. Correct. Mm -hmm. So they, they, they may not have a, what's called a service level agreement or SLA. They may not have a commitment to you uh, as to uh, uptime and all that stuff. But you know because you're using it if, if Toast.net is good. Has it been very reliable yeah, and very consistent? Yeah, I've had them for two years. Um, would it change? Like, I have Google Fi as my cell carrier, so we do a lot of going through the, so, you know, Wi-Fi wi calling. Exactly, you're doing Wi-Fi yeah. calling, yeah. That's where you want... The funny thing is that's not so much speed-specific as something called jitter, jitter and latency. Uh, those two things really impact voice and video calling. Uh, latency is the lag time between uh, the round trip between your computer the the server at the the you know the outside internet and back mm -hmm. that's latency if it if that's more than say 30 or 40 milliseconds it's going to be hard to have conversations if it goes up above 100 milliseconds there's going to be noticeable lag so that's one thing jitter is a little bit of a weird one that a lot of people don't talk about uh, and a lot of tests don't tell you but that's that's the up and down between the the latency, how's it how it goes back and forth, and then there's one more thing: packet drops. So a good if you did a good speed test that would tell you those three things, and do it over a period of a couple of days at different times, mm -hmm. um, that would tell you about the quality of the signal with Toast. And if it's low in all those things, um, that would be really good to know. Cloudflare has a speed test that measures latency and jitter. It's at speed.cloudflare.com. And I would, I would, that would be a good one to try. That will tell you not just the raw speed, because raw speed isn't everything. Jitter, latency, and packet drop, packet loss are maybe even more important. And it, I would guess with your fiber connection, you're going to be better off. I would think, I'm going to say 100-100 is better than 4400 from a cable provider. So okay. if, you, if you feel you need if you feel you need more bandwidth, go for the hundred hundred. Cable is all over the place, and that's the problem. Okay, you know, excellent. And that also excellent. depends on you know, how how much they provision the head end with, you know, how much neighborhood sharing uh, is going on, um, uh, you know, the quality of the infrastructure. There's you know your mileage may vary. Mm -hmm. That's why use this Cloudflare speed test. And really get a sense of what you're getting. And so, unfortunately, you can't test Spectrum. But I bet you you're getting better with ToastNet. Hey, got to run. Thank you so Thanks much. Thanks for calling. Yeah, great question. The Tech Eye podcast this week brought to you by Simply Safe. Simply Safe is the best home security system you can get. I can say that without fear of contradiction. And first of all, everybody agrees. But also, in my experience, and by the way, my kids use it too because I want them to be safe. It's affordable. It's easy. They ins you install it yourself. It's been great during COVID because you don't have to have an installer come in. They're peel and stick sensors. Plus, you get to design your own system. Go to the Simply Safe website. They have simplysafe.com/twit. They have sensors for everything: glass break, a door and window opening sensors, motion sensors. You know, like sonar. They, you put that in the hallways. They have cameras. They even have things like water sensors. So you put that next to your, you know, underneath your water heater in case, or near pipes in case they burst. You get the sensors you want. They're very affordable. You peel and stick. You put them in yourself. They're also, and I should point out, they're great for renters because you could unpeel and unstick and take them with you, which is which is kind of the how they started, you know. But it's just a great system. Plus, the other thing that I really like about Simply Safe is the monitoring. They have the same professional monitoring 24 7 that you would get from any of the other guys, but at about a third of the cost. And no contracts, month to month. It's just, it's, it's as if somebody said, let's take this kind of crazy home security business and make it sensible. What part of your house is the part you worry about? I'll tell you for me, it's the gym. It's way off in a corner in the house. Uh, when people use it, they open the doors. We got French doors or you know sliding glass doors. We got windows. They open everything up because you want fresh air when you're working out. And they often forget to close them. I'm always a little nervous. Put the sensors on there, man. You know, you know. 
You never worry. Your security system from Simply Safe is going to protect you day and night. You're always being guarded. And it's nice because you always feel safe, especially with everybody home. The last thing I want is somebody breaking in while I'm there, right? It's nice. I could press the home button on my Simply Safe keyboard and I hear the bass say, alarm on. And you know, if somebody tried to go in, come in, I would know about it. The police would know about it. By the way, the police respond very quickly to Simply Safe because they could check the cameras. The Simply Safe uh, monitoring people know it's not a false alarm. This is the real deal. Get on out there. Two minutes to customize the system at the website, half an hour to set it up. It's so easy. What are you waiting for? Protect yourself, protect your home, protect your family. That's what's really the bottom line. Go to simplysafe.com slash twit to customize your system. You will get, if you go to that address, you will get a free security camera. Isn't that nice? Free. And it's a 60-day, two-month risk-free trial. So there's absolutely no reason not to do this, except that, you know, you're putting it off. I know you've been putting it off. I put it off for a long time, too. Don't put it off anymore. Simplysafe.com slash twit. We thank him so much for sponsoring the Tech Guy podcast. Simplysafe.com slash twit. It's car time. Sam Abul Samet is here. Car man. He is uh, the principal researcher at Guidehouse Insa Insights. He's an analyst for the automotive industry, is in other words. Also, podcaster Will Bearings, his new pod, not new, his old podcast with a new co host. Three and a half years old now. Yeah, but you got that. That great co-host, Robbie, is one of my favorite guys in the world. So between the two and of Nicole. you and Nicole, that's got three, of, us. three yeah. of you. That's a great show. Yeah. Wheelbearings.media. And we're lucky enough to have him join us every week to talk about automotive technology. Uh, you know, it's funny. as the show. You know, I've been doing this show since the early 90s. <laughs> in the early 90s, mostly we were talking about interrupt requests on your serial bus <laughs> and how to get, you know, weird, you know, little doohickeys now honestly we got to do space we got to do travel we got to do cars because technology is everywhere and it's boy cars are getting more and more high tech all the time yeah and you know they're they're uh, you talk about uh you know talk talk about everything with the chip in it in this show and cars you know have probably Many chips. more chips in them <laughs> than, yeah. than almost any device we have yeah uh you know and in, in, in many cases you have you know uh, potentially hundreds of chips, individual chips within a car, you know, as many as a hundred or more individual little electronic control units, each one of which might have multiple chips in there for the microcontrollers and RAM and, and DSPs and all kinds of other things. And one of the, somebody in the chat was asking about uh, the chip shortage. And, you know, this is affecting every automaker uh, globally. They're, they're all getting hit by this and, and it's causing production disruptions. And if you're actually going out shopping for a new car, you might have a hard time finding what you're looking for just because they're not able to wow. build as many cars. Ford had their, their Q1 earnings call earlier this week. And one of the things they said on there, you know, they had record profits, uh, $3.5 billion in profit in the first quarter. But they said in Q2, we might only be able to build about half as many vehicles as we were planning to just because we cannot get the chips. Uh, there's been so much disruption. There was a big, there was a fire at a plant, a uh, chip plant, a Renaissance plant in Japan recently that's just now getting back up and running again. And, um, you know, there's been all kinds of disruptions at various plants around the world over the last year. That's a year. big deal. I mean, half their production means they're going to sell half as many cars as they could. That's a big yeah. deal. Uh, absolutely, it, it, it's it's going to hurt, you know. And they, you know, Ford. I think they're they're estimating for Ford. You know, it's probably going to cost them uh, somewhere between one and one and a half billion dollars in potential lost profits. And you know, same thing goes for for other auto, you know, major automakers. You know, similar kinds of lost profitability and sales. Uh, and that's that's going to be. A real problem. And it's funny, uh, we were just talking today, on, we were recording uh, Wheel Bearings earlier this morning, and um, both of my co-hosts, uh, Roberto Baldwin and Nicole Wakelin, had been taking vacations this past week and trying to rent cars uh, has been, it. been a real challenge yeah. because last year, you know, when the, the pandemic really got rolling and everybody stopped traveling, most of the car rental companies disposed of much of their fleets. You know, in the case of Hertz, for example, you know they sold off more than half of their fleet because, and they went into Chapter Eleven bankruptcy uh, last summer, uh, and they sold more than half of their their rental fleet 
but now as uh, people are starting to travel again, there's demand for rental cars. There's no cars to be had. They can't buy more cars because they just there aren't they aren't available, and so it's there. People are having a hard time. You know, in some cases, waiting waiting in line uh, for multiple hours at the rental counter at airports trying to get a car, uh, and then also. Um, in, in some cases, not even be able to get one. Uh, I know Nicole, uh, she land, or yeah, Nicole, when she landed in Atlanta uh, earlier in the week, um, she had a car reserved and she got to the counter and said, Sorry, we don't have anything for you. <laughs> it was, they were all gone. Uh, and she ended up having to go somewhere else and got a car that was that was dirty, hadn't been cleaned. Somebody else, somebody had left their old mask in the in the center console. It was terrible. Uh, so if you're if you're traveling, if you're planning to travel um, over the next several months, you probably want to try to schedule a rental car as soon as far in advance as you possibly can. And maybe even, um, you know, schedule, you know, get more than one, you know, try and try and get more than one confirmation in case you end up in a situation where you don't, there's nothing available um, wow. because that may wow. well be the case. Wow. That's amazing. Either that or just go somewhere where you can just drive your own car. You know, we're thinking of going to Hawaii in the summer and I, I'm sure that'll be the issue. And so we're just going, we're going to try to go somewhere where they're. You know, we'll look we'll take mass transit or things like that because yeah, there, there, there are no cars. Yeah. There's no cars out there. Yeah. So anyway, the topic that I that I actually wanted to talk about this week uh, was vehicle to everything communications. Um, and uh, so what this is, this is uh, something that the industry has been working on for. Uh, close to 20, for at least 15 years now, uh, which is the idea of having uh, vehicles that broadcast and receive messages to other vehicles, to pedestrians, to infrastructure. Um, and originally the, the plan was uh, the FCC had set aside some spectrum at 5.9 gigahertz specifically for this purpose. And the plan was to use something called dedicated short range communications, which is a, a variation on Wi-Fi. It's 802.11p Wi-Fi. Uh, they've since, most of the industry has transitioned to a newer technology called cellular VDX, which is using cellular radio technology, but without uh, without having to go through a cell network. So it can go direct from node to node. So from a vehicle to a phone to, uh, to infrastructure. And um, we're finally going to start seeing some of this rolling out. There's been a bunch of pilot projects around the country over the last decade, uh, but we're going to, I think we're finally going to start seeing it rolling out more broadly in 2022. They're already doing it in China and, and some other locations. Uh, but there's been a couple of interesting applications of it recently with autonomous vehicles, um, because as I think we talked about before, with AVs, all those sensors on your car, on, the, on an autonomous vehicle, they're limited to line of sight. They can't see around corners. They can't see through the truck that's in front of the vehicle. And so what uh, Argo uh, AI, which is the company that's uh, partly owned by Ford and Volkswagen, and, and working with them for their upcoming AVs. As well as Motional, which has which is a joint venture of Aptiv and uh, Hyundai, they have started to install sensors at intersections. So using cameras, radar, lidar mounted above an intersection where they can get a bird's eye view, and uh, equipping those with Vita X radios, so they can transmit to their their AVs information about what's coming, what's approaching that intersection when you're at complex intersections where, you know, you've got, maybe you got buildings that are close to the curb and you can't see. Uh, so it can provide greater situational awareness of what's happening. And this, as, as we start to get these same radios installed in our vehicles, you'll get alerts, the same kind of alerts. You know, if there's somebody approaching a red light at high speed or uh, a vehicle ahead of you down the road um, activates its ABS or traction control indicating a slippery surface, you'll get an alert that, hey, slippery surface ahead, you know, so you can slow down and, and respond earlier. Uh, or, you know, even, um, you know, a pedestrian, you know, crossing the, crossing the intersection or, you know, coming uh, across, about to cross the street, walking out between two cars, those sensors above, you know, or even um, the, you know, sensors in the person's phone could broaden cast a message to vehicles, you know, letting you know that there's a pedestrian coming where you may not see them. So this is a potential really, really important safety advance for all kinds of vehicles. This is good news. When we get that, when do we get this? Uh, 
a few years ago, Cadillac launched a, a model that had DSRC-based V2V communications, but uh, I think 2022 is when we're going to start seeing it rolling out in, in a large number of vehicles. Because it won't be useful until kind of the majority of vehicles have it, right? I mean... Uh, right. Well, it, it'll start be, for vehicle to infrastructure. Um, you Bu know, and buildings start, that need it. it yeah, <laughs> it'll, it'll start lights. being um, yeah. uh, useful to anybody that's got a Vita X radio in their vehicle from right. day one. Cool. Sam Abul Samad. Don't forget Wheel Bearings. Great podcast. Wheelbearings.media. We'll see you next week, Sam. Thanks. Thanks, Leo. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, how's life in Ypsilanti? It's good. The sun is shining today. It's uh, going to hit a high of 83 degrees. Nice. It was about in the 67 yesterday. Nice. Um, we had some cold weather earlier in the week, but it's it's warming up again. Uh, so Good. And, yeah, um, we've got 75 here, but it's going to get in the 60s again in the middle of the week. So We're just in that yeah. weird period of spring where it comes and goes. Yeah, well, yesterday morning when I got up to take Daisy for a walk, it was 29 in the morning Woo! when I got up. That's a uh, brisk. But then it, it warmed up. It warmed up in the afternoon. That's a tr that's somewhat brisk. <laughs> yeah, well, it's typical around here. It bounces yeah. around all over the place yeah. this time of year. Yeah. All right, thank you, Sam. Have a good thank one. Thank you, Leo. All right, we'll I'll talk, talk later. to you next week. All right, bye bye. Leo Laporte, the tech guy, eighty eight, eighty eight. Ask Leo. Eh, that's the number. Eva, Cortland, New York. Hello, Eva. Oh, hi, Leo. Oh, hi, Eva. How are you? Wonderful to talk with you. I enjoy your show every Thank week. You. It's sort of a can't miss show. Oh wow! Appointment TV. That's great. Thank you. <laughs> That's very nice. Yeah. So I'm doing this little publishing project, and I have a like a 12 year old computer that I'm working with. A 12 year old computer is probably as tricksy to work with as a 12 year old boy would be. Maybe even a little more so, a little more recalcitrant. Yeah. So what's going on? Yeah, so I need, um, I've, I've looked into uh, InDesign and, and iStudio, Quark and WordPress and all that. Oh, and yeah. All of the, um, the layout and design, I haven't been able to find much that, that just had some really straightforward tools. Are you making a, what are you making, a newsletter, a new, newspaper, no, no, a book? I have, I have like a book, yeah. A book? I have a, okay. I have a small publishing house. Oh, and, nice. Yeah, and I, I used to do web design, you know. So you are a designer, so you know what you're doing. Yeah. Uh, you know, and, and you probably, if you have a 12-year-old computer, you remember uh, some of the original, like Aldous Page Maker, which was the first <laughs> widely used page design program. It came out with the early Macintoshes. Um, but I think Adobe has superseded. I don't even know if all this is around. I know PageMaker isn't. Uh, yeah, I think Adobe's out for me because everything is on a license. Now, yeah, and, and so got to run it on. Yeah, who wants to pay? Now. Who wants to pay? You know, fifty dollars a a month. So um, yeah, now you don't I want InDesign. You know, the company that used to make really inexpensive. Are you on a Mac or a PC doing this? Uh, I'm doing it on a PC. I mean, on a Mac, except if if it dies, I've got a PC to to do it. But it's got to be offline. So I was looking at this um, Swift publisher, but they're based in Ukraine, and I was like, can I trust this? Yeah, you can. First of all, Ukraine isn't Russia yet, but uh, some of the best programmers in the world are in Ukraine. If you decided not to use software written in uh, in Eastern Europe or, or even just Ukraine, you you. You'd, there'd be a, you'd be surprised how much software you wouldn't get. So nowadays, uh, a lot of a lot of coding is done in Eastern Europe, in Russia, in uh, Asia, uh, because the coders are very good. India, uh, but they're a lot less expensive per hour. So a lot of the software, uh, for instance, I, I use software for my photo uh, editing from a company called Skylum. They they use Luminar and uh, really excellent cutting edge photo editing and they're they're a Ukraine company because the programmers are very, you know what happened I think the old Soviet Union had a very high level of technical training, but then the when when the Soviet Union fell, and these companies split off the economy collapsed, 
uh, a lot of people were out of work. And so they're, they're a lot less expensive, but they have very high skills. Excellent. I'm going to look, uh, I would look at a company also called Serif, S-E-R-I-F. Now, this is funny because this is a, a well-known name in desktop publishing. They used to make kind of low-end PC desktop publishing software. Mm -hmm. I've heard the name, yeah. Yeah. But now they, they've pivoted and they're now making some of the best apps out there under the Affinity brand. And for desktop, Mac and Windows, but also for iPad. And Affinity Publisher is, you know, I've been using Affinity Photo. It's an amazing deal. Uh, right now, all of their software is 50% off. And there's a free trial, so you should obviously try it before you buy it. Uh, but I've been using Affinity Photo, and it is widely considered the best photo editing app on Mac and uh, iPad. I have not used Publisher but but given their heredi their heritage in p desktop publishing and what they've done with Affinity, I think I would look at Affinity Publisher, Windows, Mac, so you can use it on either. Um, and I'm going to bet that it is more modern. They've decided. I think they've really decided that they want to be that they, they want to shed their image as the old low cost company. Well, I want the I want the old low cost company. Yeah. Well, this <laughs> well. <laughs> well, uh, you know, this is, it's funny, the price is still old low-cost companies, 25 bucks. Oh, gee. <laughs> uh, but, and they have a bunch of templates you can buy. I think that's how they, they expect to make profit. But since you know exactly what you're doing, you, you don't need any fancy templates. Yeah. Uh, I would take a look. I don't know for book publishing if that's the best. Right. Um, but I'll compare it. I'll compare it. And the other, the other piece was... Um, uh, has CSS changed over 10 years? Drastically. Oh, okay. But the fundamentals you learned are going to be very helpful. So uh, CSS has become the, uh, one, of the, one of the three important tools for web design now. Uh -huh. with, with JavaScript and CSS, uh, I'm not even going to put HTML in there anymore. <laughs> but no. there, yeah, you, that's what I, I was using. That's what you were using. I mean, yeah. you still will do it, but yeah. nowadays m people frequently use frameworks where you're not even seeing HTML. But you will see CSS. It stands for Cascading Style Sheets, and that's its heredity, is the old style sheets where you would say, look, this is the page, and I'm going to apply this styling to it. Mm -hmm. uh, and, 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 you know, back when you were doing it, that's exactly how it was used. But today, CSS does everything from animated graphics to push buttons to everything. It's very powerful. And it's often compiled, believe it or not. It's not just plain text anymore. Uh, people use CSS compilation tools to create faster CSS and more powerful. So I would take a look at modern CSS. The good news is you know CSS. The structure and language looks exactly the same. So you kind of already know how to do it. But there are a lot of new technologies that will mean CSS is, I think, a very important power tool for you. Sounds like I need to take a class in it. Um, you, I'm sorry I interrupted you when you were going to talk about the publishing, you know, the uh, for... For, um, for books. Yeah, for books. Yeah, because that's a little different. A book isn't, you know, you're, it's not a newspaper, it's not a newsletter, it's not fancy. You're not, you know, you're probably not putting a lot of um, uh, illustrations in, or are you? There are... Yeah, there's a bunch of illustrations. Okay. I kind of need to do both, but I can have two separate programs. You know, if one's better at at the text and are you gonna? Is it a print book or an ebook? Um, initially a print book. Okay. Yeah. Um, so and it, I mean, it, you, if anything can be an ebook. Twenty five bucks for Affinity Publisher. They have a ninety day trial. They make that very easy. Okay. And but you, here's the, one that is for books. Okay. That the chat room is recommending, and I've heard very good things about it. Called Vellum. It sounds like a book publisher, doesn't it? Vellum, yeah. V E L L U M dot pub. It's Mac only, and it's two hundred fifty bucks. But it's designed for books. Okay. It does paper as print books as well as uh, e-books. So it, you know, I'm looking at it, and it looks really like it's a beautiful way to make books. Yes, you know, as a designer, designing a book is very different from designing, uh, you know, a newspaper or a newsletter or anything like that. So. <laughs> Yeah, and most of the programs out there are actually geared toward that. Even, you know, InDesign and stuff is all web page. Yeah. You know. Yeah, everybody's doing that. Now, you, are you doing this on a 12-year-old Mac? <laughs> yeah. Okay. That's, that's, 
you know, you go with what you got. No, no, I'm not knocking it by any means. In fact, boy, yeah. I wish I wish we could keep these computers longer. The problem is, and this is going to be a problem with that Mac, you can't use the latest, you know, probably can't even use Catalina, the latest operating system. So you may have some limits on the software you can use with a 12-year-old exactly. Mac. That's what I'm running into. Yeah. I'm, I'm 10.68, you know. Can you get to, uh, boy, yeah. No, I can't. That's it, 10.6, huh? Yeah. 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 Well, this is a good time to be buying a Mac. <laughs> I, I don't, it's not in the budget yet. Yeah. I've, got to, I've got to sell some books. Then I can sell buy. some books. <laughs> make that your goal because the yeah. new Macs have that new processor. All the Serif stuff is designed for the new processor, by the way. I see. And it's fast. It's easy. They're, I mean, light years ahead of what you're using, I'm sorry to say. But 12-year-old yeah. uh, computers, that's not as old as it used to be, <laughs> you know, because processor speeds haven't improved that much. Uh, so it's really a matter more of the software and particularly the operating system, and, and that's where you're going to run up against things. I don't know if Serif will work. Try it. Yeah, see, Vellum is iOS or Mac OS 10 and 14 or later. <sighs> I, bet you, uh, I bet you anything, if you look at uh, Serif, you're going to have the same problem, Eva. Oh, okay. But you should you should yeah. you should check. Yeah, I think I'm I think I'm going to go with the Ukrainian one then. <laughs> Which one's the Ukrainian one? Uh, that's the um, Swift publisher. They I I actually was able to talk to them on the phone and and they uh, were very. Uh, they said I could get like an older version of the software. Yeah, it's so only I, twenty bucks. Yeah, like yeah. You know, these designer these these programmers in Ukraine are great, and they're not Russian spies. Yeah. Yet. <laughs> you know, if Russia uh, invades, which I'm sure they, they're they no, dying just, to do. I mean, Ukraine's pretty corrupt, you know. Yeah, it's a little corrupt. I think it's gotten better. I think uh, their, their new president's a nice young man. But uh, <laughs> I, uh, I wouldn't worry about that because, honestly, that's, uh, that's some of the best programmers. And that's why uh, it's probably not. It might not even be a Ukrainian company. It might just have Ukrainian programmers. And I still would look at, I would still, maybe Serif will have the same thing where you can get an older version. Because yeah. Affinity Publisher is widely considered to be the best publisher at 25 bucks. Boy, that's that's hard to beat, right? Yeah, really. Well, I do. There's a heavy graphic side, and then there's the layout of the book itself. So I'm going to have to work with two different programs, probably. Yeah. Um, a serif uh, publisher was the uh, Mac app of the year uh, last year, so that's that's a good sign. But it also probably means it doesn't run on an old Mac. <laughs> Let me see. Let me look at the tech specs real quick. Yeah. Uh, because uh, yeah, it does it. The oldest operating system is Mavericks. That's ten nine. That's actually pretty old. That's not so bad, but it's still not old enough. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, that's fine. <sighs> Look, uh, keep keep an eye out on the Mac Minis. They're they're you know fairly inexpensive, huh? under well under a thousand. Okay. Um, and they uh, they you know you bring your own monitor and keyboard and mouse, so that saves you some money. But um, yeah, yeah. Well, uh, so much. For nice you. to talk to you, Eva. What's the book about? Mm -hmm. What's the book about? It's it's a fun thing for seniors. Nice. It's, it's actually, it's a book for seniors. Nice. <laughs> Well, seniors, uh, seniors need as a as a soon. When, what is senior? Anything over fifty. Oh, I'm a senior then. <laughs> I'm a very senior. I'm. I'll be sixty five this year. So that's senior, right? Oh yeah. Yeah, I get Medicare. Once you're a Medicare man, you're senior. That's it. That's it. <laughs> Eva, pleasure talking to you. Thanks. Likewise. Take care. <laughs> bye bye. Well, hey, hey, how are you today? Leo Laporte here, the tech guy. Time to talk computers, the internet, home theater, digital photography, smartphones, smart watches. 8888-ASK-LEO is the phone number. If you want to talk tech, basically, anything with a chip in it, 888-827-5536. Toll free from anywhere in the U.S. or Canada. Rod Pyle, our spaceman. Coming up at the bottom of the hour, some interesting news about the helicopter on Mars, Ingenuity. They're going to, it's doing so well. Good boy, Ingenuity. Good boy. So they're going to give it some new stuff to do. We could talk about that, and I'm sure there's other space news. Space is exciting these days. Uh, and then uh, that's actually next hour, I should say. I'm a little confused. Chris Marquardt, the photo guy, coming up this hour. 
We've got a busy day ahead, so let's get right to Jerry in Costa Mesa, California, our next caller. Hi, Jerry. Hi, how are you doing? I'm great. How are you? Well, uh, it's been a long time since I talked to you. Uh, you kind of changed from uh, aerial photography, and now I'm writing. <laughs> awesome. So you used to, uh, did you get in a plane, a helicopter, a drone? How did you do your aerial photography? Uh, actually, I had uh, ratings in aircraft and helicopters. Nice. And uh, anything anybody would pay me to go into or up into, I would do it. So, yeah. Fun. Yeah. So do you, are you not flying anymore or are you, you just... No, about eight years ago, I had a, just a simple accident. I've had plane crashes and stuff before, but I... Lost the sight in one eye with a oh, nuts. simple fall. And you need and, your and you need your uh, you need your binocular vision, don't you, to fly? Oh well, you need your depth perception. Yeah. And uh, yeah. boy, I was right eyed, and I thought, oh, well, I'll come back out of this with no problem at all. My left eye doesn't photograph worth. Oh, rats! Yeah. So, but do you like writing? Is it a nice alternative? Well, it is, and you know, I was seventy when that happened, so I figured, ah, boo, that's you know, it's kind of time to hang it up and so i figured i would start writing about all my adventures oh now that's a book i want to read jerry oh yeah well it's uh i got a cute little title to it it's called crash and splash because between <laughs> <laughs> my husband and i we had a number of crashes and splashes all over the world so it's gonna make for a fun book what a life how yeah. exciting yeah well how can i help you in your journey well, you can help me in my journey. Uh, I finally have gotten my act into gear and back uh, on my computer. It's, and, it's uh, a lot easier to write on your computer. I have to well, say, though, there's one hazard to it. If you're longhand writing it, uh, you're not tempted to constantly edit. You know, you just write it out. But when you're on your computer, you can really get sidetracked fixing what you've written. Well, that's it. And and I had uh, oh, journals over the years that I'm writing out of, and I thought, oh, this is going to be a piece of cake. I'll just get on Word and just uh, right. bang it away. Well, I'm uh, about uh, 25,000 words into Good I'm start. To about 1975. <laughs> <laughs> well, good. It's going to be a thick book, but I want a thick book. I want to hear the whole story. Yeah. Well, I'll have a lot of photography in it too, oh. which is oh, is, Jerry, I will so. please when you when you get ready to publish this, you call and we'll give you a big plug. I want to see this. Well, yeah, and I'll send you a copy of it. I, I it's it's going to be worthwhile if I can get, ever get my acting gear to get all my stuff together. Getting back into Word was a, a big project, but now uh, I've got that all taken care of. But I'm concerned about uh, saving it. I. Uh -huh. Yeah. <laughs> I don't want to end up losing no. part of it. No, when you get and to 25,000 words, you think, I don't want to type this again. That's right. And I've made a couple of hard copies of it, but that, you know, that doesn't do you anything. You know, I have a good I friend. Sort of very, a hard drive to... Yeah, let me tell you what you need to do because this is okay. super important. Okay. I have a good friend, very well known novelist. If I said her name, you'd know it. Okay. Uh, about. 25, 30 years ago, there was a big fire in the Oakland Hills. And yeah, I know the fire. <laughs> yep. Her house burned <laughs> and yeah, and yeah. all copies of the novel she was working on. Oh, man. And, uh, well, remember Ralph Ellison who wrote Invisible Man? Same thing happened to him. He never wrote another novel. It was yeah. it. He said, that's yeah. it. Not gonna, I'm not going to write anymore. That's yeah. terrible, right? Yeah. So let's not have that happen to you. Yeah. Well, in the old days of film photography, I ended up buying a fireproof safe. And so I stuck all my film in a fireproof safe. But, you know. Yeah, even that. You know, nowadays with digital, we don't have to. We, we can do much better. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But here's the key. Okay. And I do talk about backup a lot. But here's the key. You certainly need a local backup. Just for simple things like, oh, I accidentally change the word Cessna to celery, I've got to yeah. fix that. Thank goodness I have a backup of the, <laughs> you know, I don't want to go through 25,000 pages of celery and find them all. So, by the way, that's something you, it's a lot easier to fix in yeah. Word than uh, to yeah. do it longhand. So, and it's also a lot easier to do in Word than it is to yeah, do longhand. <laughs> celery. <laughs> That's how we compared to sometimes. <laughs> so, so uh, you definitely want a local backup. But and, okay. and that can be on an external hard drive, like you were mentioning. You can it, they're okay. cheap, they're easy. You plug it into the computer, 
and and you can even set it up to is it are you on a windows machine yeah windows yeah. Uh -huh. you can set it up to automatically back up it's better to do automatic that's why actually i recommend you buy a product that will do this on a regular basis but yeah. it's not enough merely to back up uh locally you've also got because of that oakland hills fire story and this is why i mentioned that bad things can happen and your backups can be lost too if, if right. they're sitting next to the computer. Right. So you also want what we call off-site, really important off-site backup. My friend uh, Peter Krog is a very accomplished photographer. He worked with the Association of uh, Professional Photographers and the Library of Congress to create a uh, best practices for photographers, which is probably something you, you should look at because it's all about computer uh, workflow. It's DP for digital photography, dpbestflow.org. Best flow? Best flow, as in best workflow. Okay. D Digital photography, yeah. best workflow. He did it with the American Society of Media Photographers in the Library of Congress. So it's, and okay. he's really good. There's a, there's a section there on backup. And he, he coined the term 321 backup. And I quote him all the time on this three copies of everything, yeah. one, uh, two different media. That, that's a little old-fashioned. That goes back to the yeah. days when you had CDs and tapes and other kinds of backup. Yeah. You don't have to worry about that. Yeah. But most importantly, the one, which is one copy off-site. It could be as simple as taking a hard drive to work. Mm -hmm. But nowadays, with cloud backup services, it's really easy. In fact, I'm going to mention our sponsor at this point because... This isn't the only way to go, and I'm, you know, uh, you know, obviously there are many choices, but iDrive makes it very easy because they'll do the local backup automatically on a schedule, but they'll also back it up to the cloud, and they even do versioning. So they they call them snapshots, so that when you back up that novel, it'll also keep that copy, and then when you back it up again, it'll keep that copy, and when you back it up again, it'll keep that copy, so you can go back in time to previous versions, which is extremely useful. But most importantly, it's off-site. It's in the cloud. So if the house, if you get in the, if there's a fire or your pipes burst or something, you, you don't lose everything. So print backups are nice, but that's, that's what my friend, the novelist, did. And, of course, her print backups were destroyed. Yeah. So it's a start. But honestly, the best now that we have digital and you're doing it digitally, which is great, uh, then the best thing to do, and do this with your photographs too, obviously, yeah. Um, now they the other thing I like about iDrive is they give you uh, eight terabytes, uh, which is more than anybody. Well, that's, yeah, that's, yeah. That's, that's, especially yeah. since you're uploading it, you can't. I mean, it would take you a year or two to get eight terabytes uploaded. So okay. that's right. plenty. Yeah. In other words, it's virtually yeah. infinite. It's yeah. yeah, it's infinite storage, and it's very affordable. Um, so, yeah. in fact, I think I'm going to probably do an iDrive commercial any minute now. I do them all the time. So okay. you'll okay. you'll hear the you'll hear the details, okay. but. Uh, but it doesn't have to be iDrive. There's lots of companies that do this. Backblaze does it. Um, they're very good. There's a lot of companies that do it. What you're looking at is cloud backup. Okay. And the, the idea is it's not just local. What you want is both, local and cloud. Right. Okay. That's, the, that's the two in three, two, one. Three copies yeah, okay. is an original, two backups. The two backups are local in the cloud, and that's the one. One of, one of them has to be off-site, or you're really yeah. running a risk. Yeah. I can't wait to hear Crash to Splash, <laughs> or Crash and Splash. Crash and Splash. I can't yeah. wait to read it. <laughs> okay. That's going to be yeah. awesome. Are you using a subscription version of uh, Microsoft Office? Yeah. Okay, so then the other thing I should have mentioned is you already have a terabyte of storage in Microsoft's OneDrive. Okay. So use that. In fact, Office will automatically save locally and in OneDrive as you use Word so that automatically you've got versions in the cloud, which is really nice. Yeah. Well, okay, I don't know that I've got that set up that way because I, I know that when I go back to check what I've written, for the day or for the week, uh, I, I, I've got a, it comes up at the bottom of the thing. That I've got it. It's auto. Oh, I don't know what the verbiage is, that, but that's been uh, automatically uh, uploaded to the cloud. Yeah. Yeah. If you've got your OneDrive set up, yeah. OneDrive is doing it for you because they know, you yeah. know, nowadays yeah. everybody has this issue. You know, because yeah, yeah. hard drives die. I mean, all sorts of things happen to data in a computer. You should never, never, ever trust just one copy of anything. It's going to, yeah. you'll lose it. And this is way too valuable, not just to you, Eva, 
I mean, Jerry, but to everybody, it's, it's this is you. You can't. We require that you write this novel or this uh, <laughs> memoir, and you well, get it out. I ended up buying a brand new computer to do it. Awesome. So I'm just you know at a nice big, big giant screen, so I can edit all. Of oh, it. I am so. On it, so I'm you know, really set up for it all. So. This is really yeah. a good adaptation because a lot of people yeah. would be bummed out. You know, you can't fly anymore. This is your life. Nah. But you got a good uh, adaptation. So many, yeah, so many great stories because uh, I, uh, we, you know, crashed in South America. <laughs> I've jumped a plane in the ocean off Newport Beach. I mean, I've crashed I, everywhere. Crazy, she says, <laughs> crazy, crazy. Stuff. And, but we just all kind of looked at it as, oh, it was just another adventure. So when I started, you know, I've always told these stories, and everybody said, oh, you need to write a book, and I thought, well, God, that's really great. I'll sit down and write a book. Well, it is. Uh, it's been a full-time job. I've been at it about three months, uh, and, and I've got, you know, 25,000 words. Or something. On mm -hmm. behalf of your future readers, thank you. I'm so <laughs> glad you're doing this. I can't wait to read it. Well, I think it'll be a very fun book. It's going to be a, kind of a vignette-type story, so two or three pages of stories, and then some photography. Oh, and perfect. Story and then photography. Perfect. That's so it's going to be an interesting book to get published, but I think that I've got... Uh, Patagonia publishers were interested in it. Um, well, they're years excellent. Ago, so I think they're excellent. Yeah, it's excellent. a travel yeah. book. Yeah, that yeah. they're a yeah. very good publisher. They'll do a beautiful yeah. job with it. If you yeah. want print and you've got photography in it, I I think it is a good idea to go with a publisher because you know they know where the best presses are and they'll go and make oh, sure yeah. the proofs are right and everything. So that's yeah, really and you good. want the photography to turn out really Absolutely. well. And I still have a lab down here in Orange County that can print off of everything I got because when I first started looking into the publishing of it, I thought, oh God, I started out, you know, in the days when 35 millimeter slides were the only thing you could wow. publish, you know? And so I went back to this lab and uh, God, they said, don't worry about it, Jerry, you bring up whatever we, we can scan it, da -da -da -da. So this, this is a brave new world for photography, but it's very oh, exciting. God, yeah. yeah, and yeah. the reproductions yeah. are, are going to be gorgeous. I can't wait. Yeah. So yeah. nice to meet you, Jerry. Okay. Thanks okay. for calling. You. Enjoy okay. your writing. How fun is that? Oh, Kev wants to read my ads, huh? Well, I tell you what. I'll post some ad copy in there. You can do. Uh, you can give me your example. You can put that. We've created because a couple of people said, "I miss the ads and the ad." Uh, you know, the uh, Club Twit ad free version. I don't see the ads. So we actually made on the uh, Discord. This is our Club Twit Discord. All the ads. It's a new section with all the ads. So uh, you know what we can do? We can post, we can post in all the ads. <laughs> yeah, I'll I'll put some I'll paste some copy in, and give you a chance. Record it and post it in all the ads as your example copy. Okay, all right. <laughs> Club Twit. I should give you a plug. Club Twit is uh, and Chris Marquardt's in it. So I don't. I'm not saying anything. I'm not saying anything that he can't already do. Club Twit is our newest uh, way to get. Our content ad free. A number of people have been asking us for that, especially tracker free. So uh, for seven bucks a month, you get audio or video, all our shows. You get special feeds just for you for all the shows without the ads, including this ad for Club Twit. <laughs> somebody, somebody said, "Hey, you know, I still hear the Club Twit ads. I still hear the house ads. What?" So I, so yeah, we'll cut the house ads out too. Uh, I didn't really think of them as ads, but okay, they are. Seven bucks, ad-free. But you also get this really, you also get, what more? You also get this fabulous Discord where conversations go on. We're doing shows in here. You can join our shows. And in fact, if you want to raise your hand, everybody but Chris from Miami, he's a quick to raise his hand. If you raise your hand, well, we can put you on the air. Now, how much would you pay? Twit.tv slash club twit. Uh, Louie, on the line from Orange County, California. Hello, Louie. How you doing, Leo? I'm well. How you doing? Good, good. Uh, it's a source problem. Um, changing sources from, you know, cable to Blu-ray to Fire Stick, whatever. What a nightmare, isn't it? Oh, by the way, it was a bus crash. I'm sorry. It wasn't a plane crash. Sorry. Uh, go ahead. <laughs> it, it, uh, it's reading out no signal. Uh, and after a few seconds, sometimes it goes black, and it's intermitting. Right. It doesn't happen all the time. Right. Uh, we're going through ARC support, uh, and it's uh, 2.1. Uh, 
And so it, is it just audio or is it audio and video? It, well, the, the, we can't get any video or audio. Both. Um, once we change from, let's say, DirecTV to Blu-ray. So tell me a little bit about how this is working. This is not unusual, by the way. Right. Uh, there are lots of things that can that can go wrong here. So tell me the chain. So you've got your Blu-ray player. What's that connected to? Uh, that's every all the other. I guess you call them sources. All the sources are connected to the receiver, the uh, AVR. So you have an AV receiver. Excellent. Right. So they all go into the AV receiver, and then the right. AV receiver has one HDMI out that goes into the TV. Right. The arc. Right. Okay. So and it goes into. You said aux. It's an it's the arc ports. It's oh, arc. I'm right. sorry. E, e, e arc out of uh, your Orange e County accent was confusing me a little. Really? Bit. <laughs> yes. The arc. The arc is the uh, audio relay. Audio relay channel. Yeah, and that's important because it, it, it. That's the one port on your TV. Most TVs have them. An ARC port, the audio return channel that. Uh, takes if you're if you have a smart TV and you're watching let's say Netflix on your smart TV there's audio in the TV you want to get that back out into the AV receiver so it can power your speakers so use the audio return channel and that's a two-way street audio goes into the TV and out um, so these it's not unusual to have HDMI issues there is an HDMI handshake that happens and in this case, it's happening between your receiver and the television, where the receiver says, I'm going to do Dolby 5.1. Uh, I'm going to do Dolby Vision. Uh, it's going to be H. It's going to be HD. And the TV says, well, I can't do Dolby Vision. Do you have HDR10? There's this whole back and forth. It's called handshaking. Remember in the old days of modems? Wrong, wrong. Right, right. Same thing. Right. So often in HDMI, the handshake will cause flickers. It'll come on, it'll come off, and then it'll stay on. But if the handshake fails, which it sounds like this might be what's going on, because you are getting that flickering, right? Right. right. Yeah. So maybe the handshake's failing. When you say flickering, does that mean one time it will work and one time it won't? Yeah. Hold on a second, because i got a break. Chris Marker coming up, but I'll help you off the air. So hang on here. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. So, yeah, the handshake is often a problem. Uh, the cables are the first thing to look at because they're easy to look at, right? Pulled one out and put a new one in. Yeah, I would try same that. Same the thing, other thing, same thing. Same thing. The other thing, and I hate to say it, but I, this has happened to me uh, with some TVs. We have a Samsung this happens with. Uh, and it's, <laughs> this is weird, but I think this might be it. W one of our TVs is in the gym. And uh, and Lisa has a treadmill in there, and it's going boom, boom. And the floor actually shakes, micro vibrations, which are getting transmitted to the TV. And I, what I believe has happened is it's shaking the HDMI cable. It's not only loosening it, but it's actually ex – this TV, the HDMI port, is expandable. It, it, it's in sections. And obviously, they design it to accommodate uh, slight variations in, in size of the cable, but – it's it's opened up to the point where it's loose, and she'll call me and she'll say the TV's out, and I go in and I and I jiggle it, and it and it fixes it, and so that's another thing to look at. It could be that the TV ports you might try another port just to see you won't get the audio return channel, but that might be uh, uh, that's one of the pot. There are many, in other words, there are many possible sources. There could be also a. Um, you know, if you got, you've already swapped the cables, I would try a different port just to make sure. Um, and, and it's not unusual to see this. Are these brand new? Uh, is everything uh, brand, brand new? new? What is brand, brand new Yamaha, brand new 2.1 cable, so it's two uh, one year old okay. uh, LG TV. Okay. It's all no. Yeah. Uh, it could, the chat room saying there are bugs in HDMI 2.1, so that's I, something I don't know anything about, but might be worth investigating. Right. Um, uh, <laughs> uh, let's see. Uh, check the firmware on the AV receiver. Um, and it happens with all the sources, right? Yes. Uh, Fire Stick uh, uh, and Blu-ray, yes. So I'm going to eliminate the sources or the source cables is the problem. It is either the it's somewhere between the AVR and the TV, right? Because right, right. so um, 
you know, certainly update firmware everywhere. 2.1 is a brand new technology, and that is possible that there's an issue. You don't have any splitters in there, Matt Ryder's asking. No, no splitters, and I do have a technician coming out. Let him look at it. That's about, you know, because I'm, I'm baffled totally. Uh, my thought is it's the uh, board, the uh, pro, pro, what do they call it? Pro logic board. Pro logic board. board, yeah. That's my thought. Yeah. And that's in the AVR? But that's in, that would be in the TV. In the TV? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, golly. Good golly. I mean, there are, you know, this is a tricky thing. I always think it's the cable or the connection in the cable. And that's kind of, so sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Right. Yeah. More times it doesn't. And some, sometimes it, it will it, it will work. But most of the times it's not working when you, you do your switching. Yeah. Uh, do you eventually get it working, or do you never get to see that? Uh, yeah, three hours later, sometimes <laughs> you jiggle later, it, you play it, with it. It's, I don't, yeah, I don't even do that anymore. I, I just wait, wait for a minute, <laughs> <laughs> and then it comes back. Yeah. yeah, it sounds like a poor handshake or a poor signal. It, it really is an HDMI issue. So that's an interesting conundrum, frankly. Um, All right. I think it's worth having the tech come out in case it's something serious. He can just replace yeah, it. And absolutely. the other thing, he'll tell me. He'll absolutely. Get another 2.1. Absolutely. No. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't have any obvious things for you. I've told you some of the things I've seen happen, and the handshake is tricky. Yeah. Yes. It, yeah. It's driving me out of my mind yeah. all week. Yeah. I'm sorry. We'll get it. Yeah. We'll get it. Hey, thanks for the call. I'm sorry I couldn't be more help. Don't take my Kodachrome away. I got some pictures to take. Ladies and gentlemen, it's time for our photo guy, my personal photo sensei, Mr. Chris Marquardt at sensei.photo. Hello, Chris Marquardt. Hello. One How morning. is everything? Uh, everything's good. One morning. One morning. <laughs> One morning. Big D's teaching me. As you me, say in Germany. Uh, yes. Teaching me the German <laughs> greetings. Uh, Chris is a very accomplished photographer in his own right an expert in uh, digital photography and film photography and wide-angle photography. And I could say that because uh, he's written books on all three subjects and uh, <laughs> joins us every week to help us get better pictures. This week, it's the long-awaited photo assignment review. What was our assignment this month, Chris? It was the you assignment. You! And we have an entire page full of photos that were submitted by listeners of this show and uh I'm, it was a tough choice this time because you know you is those very, photos is a, a lot of those have it's a broad subject <laughs> well it's broad but also the results are very personal people open up they they yeah. dare to go in front of their camera at least some of them did um or they shot a picture of someone they love or something they love or something that defines them so it's also it's not just very broad it's also very intimate and uh it was a it was a tough choice too uh, to look at the photos um, and find the three that I will now talk about. We're going to do a crazy is... thing, which is talk about pictures on the radio. <laughs> uh, we will we will put a link to all of these photos in the show notes. James Ruvo's doing that right now, so you can see them. Uh, but uh, I think you do a good job of describing them as well. So let's but do our talking. First. Talking about photos, we've we've done this for how long now? Sixteen years, here? So <laughs> yeah, it's, um, it's just what so. You do. First photo, yeah. First photo by Jane McFarland uh, doesn't have a proper title. Oh well. Anyway, um, I like the photo very much. So it's a photo of. I guess it's her daughter, probably in a swimming pool and. You just have the daughter looking in from like the edge of the photo and it's a very dynamic shot. There's like sp splashes of water in the air. So it's a very short shutter speed. It's bright sunlight and it kind of, it froze the motion. So it has that sense of motion. It has that sense of joy. It has the sense of, well, someone loving the water. And uh, what I like about this from, from a purely photographic point of view is that it has a very reduced color palette. So you have mm. the majority of the picture is just the, the, the turquoise water, the greenish water, and uh, and then the person's face on it with it's, the goggles the on. The composition, everything is really nice on this. Really, really nice. Isn't it wonderful? Yeah. And 
it it yeah and and then it's been taken by an iphone so it doesn't even it's not even a special high brow camera well, boy, boy, that, it's that tells you something holy cow is that a is that a good yes. image wow but but wow. the but the reduced color palette i'm i really like photos that have that uh, sort of a reduction in them and this is a reduced photo while showing like a really special moment a very yeah. fun moment yeah and pure joy. This so, is a beautiful. Yeah, well done. One of my favorites. That's a gorgeous picture. Really good. All right. Yeah. What else? Uh, second one is by Kyle Roebuck. Looking up on the way down, and <laughs> that one, that one is. I've I've chosen this because of the very unusual perspective. So you see a person. Well, you see is a view from above down onto a person until you realize that it's a selfie. And uh, that person, Kyle, is standing in an elevator and he's shooting with a camera at hip level. He's shooting upwards against the reflective, against the mirror ceiling of the elevator. So oh, it hysterical. turns into this photo of, of well, pretty much as if someone was looking down on him from pretty high above. And it's just, it's so unusual. It's so creative because I keep telling people, use a different perspective than the one that you see the world from every single day. Your eye height is just not a very exciting per, uh, perspective. So this is a very different perspective and he uses the, the his environment uh, to his advantage here. That's Wonderful. Fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well done. Well, well done. And then last but not least, the third one is by Alex Zarnowski, Smelling the Flowers. Oh, this and is a little pun, I, a visual pun or visual joke. I love it. It's a visual joke, Smelling the Flowers. And what you can see is uh, probably his own shadow. And uh, the, so, so the sun is low. It is probably the evening sun the sun is low so you see you see the, the warm light of the sun and then you see the shadow of the person um which is which has its nose close to uh flowers so Beautiful. it's like, as if the shadow was smelling the flowers and again it has a very reduced color palette everything is warm um Everything, the wall in the background, the brick wall and the, the the tree stump in the foreground, they are warm, brownish, yellowish, orangish warm. And then you have this a little bit of green and then you have this uh, these specks of blue from the uh, from the flowers. So our, our discord chat um, said that uh, it looks like he's wearing a deer stalker hat. So he looks a little like Sherlock Holmes <laughs> sniffing the flowers. <laughs> Sort of, yes. sort of, yeah, yes. yeah. But yeah, but again, again, a lovely composition and it uh, it tells you something about Alex, doesn't it? He it likes does. Flowers. This was a good and assignment. He's creative. I like the open-ended yeah. assignments. I think they're, well, but you know, it goes both ways. I also like the assignments that are very restrictive. Uh, different kinds of creativity stimulated by each. I guess yes. we're ready and for you're, you're a going new assignment. Yes, you're going to love it. So this is the end of our alphabet. We finally reached the Z or the Z of our alphabet. Um, and uh, the assignment has been suggested in the group. Uh, the name, I, I don't remember the name, sorry for that. But um, it has been suggested in our little thread where we look for these. And it is zigzag. Zigzag, of course, with a Z. Zigzag. What else could it be? Of zigzag. Course. So, All right. So that means, just so everybody understands what an assignment is, so we're all on the same page, it means your job, should you choose to accept it, is to go out and take as many pictures as you can. doesn't matter if you have a fancy camera. In fact, my favorite photo in that whole set was an iPhone uh, picture. Don't need a fancy camera. You just need a camera of some kind. And you're going to wander about, whether in your home or outside or wherever you are, your work, and, and seek an image that re represents, and we don't want to be too specific, the idea, the concept, zigzag. Now, when you find a good one, you can do up to one a week. We're going to do this for four weeks, so that means we could upload four images if you want. But if you if you find one, you say, yes, Chris is going to love this one. Uh, you can upload it to Flickr.com. That's a photo sharing site. It's free to use. We love it and uh, recommend it. A great way to get comments on your photography. And we have a group there called the Tech Guy Group. We've had it for, how many years is it? 10, 15 years? A long time now. 
Well, around that, yes. 13,000 members. You'll know you're in the right spot. Lots of photographs. Upload it, but make sure you tag it. Flickr is big on tagging. Make sure you tag it. T-G-Zig-Zag. All one word. All in one word. No yes. dash between zig and zag. T-G for tech guy. Just so we know that you're submitting it for the tech guy uh, photo assignment. T.G. Zigzag, our moderator there, who the wonderful Renee Silverman. She's a volunteer, and she's just great. We really appreciate all the work she does. We'll welcome you to the group if you're not already a member, and she'll also uh, welcome your uh, your uh, submission. It does need to be a new photo. We want this whole point of this is not for the prizes, because there ain't none. It's for the or the uh, fame and fortune, because there's not much of that either. It's just to get you out there taking pictures. That's the whole point of this. Uh, so uh, get the get on out, take some pictures, zigzag, and uh, in about a month, Chris will pick three and talk about them once again. Thank you for everybody who submitted great images this week. Thank you, Chris Marquardt. You'll find him at Sensei.photo. He does photo coaching there and all sorts of stuff. Got great teachers. S e n s e i dot photo. And don't forget his tips from the Top Floor Podcast. <laughs> Thank you, Saw. Good images this week, this month. Thank you, yeah. thank you, thank you. Yeah, yep, yeah, that was yeah. that was that was a fun one. Joe Joe says, plot twist: the iPhone is a fancy camera. That's a good point. Nowadays, it's a, <laughs> it's a pretty pricey. Apple is the biggest camera manufacturer in the world. Oh, amazing, amazing. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, and uh, see you in a week from now. Yeah, happy May. Do you guys, uh, is it a German tradition to get the maypole out and dance around it? Uh, in the in the villages, more in the in the south of Germany, Wait, they would do I, this. I yeah. was remembering, when I was a kid, my sister went to an all-girls school, and they would, on May 1st, they would do a maypole dance, which is pretty uh -huh. cool. And then I saw the movie Midsommar, and I'll never uh, think the same way about maypoles. Have you seen that movie yet? <laughs> <laughs> no, but I think I know what it's, it's about. Uh, it's a horror movie, <sighs> but it's uh, there's a very uh, famous uh, Maypole dance in it. It's uh, I, If you haven't seen it and you're in the mood for something kind of macabre, it's pretty good. It takes place in, this, in Scandinavia, Sweden, I think, or Norway. Sounds good. Thank you, Chris. All right. See you in a week. See you later. Bye. It will come back to you, Leo Laporte, the tech Guy 8888 ask Leo the phone number. We go back to the phones right now, and uh, let's see who's been waiting the longest. Mark in Oxnard, California. Hello, Mark. Thanks for your patience. Leo, let me take you off speakerphone. All righty. Uh, long, long time listener, infrequent caller. But I have <laughs> called you before. Well, let's let's tell you how back, how far back I went. I I once called you about questions about dry loop DSL. <laughs> so. Oh my. <laughs> Oh, my, those were the days, weren't they? The old yes, days of the dry loop DSL. Yeah, anyway, plus I, my, my computer history goes back. I caught the tail end of the punch card industry working wow. at a military base. Wow. Yeah, even though I'm not that old. But anyway, my question now is, and I used to do computers for a living, but I'm kind of kind of out of it. I'm not uh, as, as, as uh, up on what's going on anymore just because. Well, all um, you have to do is listen to this show, and we'll keep you up to date. I appreciate that very yes, much. Um, yes. So I just got a new laptop recently because uh, my old one died. It was one of the few things, not to tell my story, but my house burned down in the Woolsey fire. Oh, I'm and, so uh, sorry. So the, you, ha you had a place up. things I got out was my laptop. Oh, I'm so sorry. Boy, we had a f the big fires up here, too. It was terrible. Oh. Terrible. Yeah, they were they were brutal. Uh, so I lost other a lot of other computer equipment and, oh, and so uh, hard drives and oh. your whole backup thing is uh, t take it seriously, folks, because it is it could happen to you because it happened to me. I never thought it would. Anyway, oh, I'm sorry. There. But that's why you have backup. Uh, that's why I had some backup and I had a lot of stuff organized on the, the one laptop I got out of the, out of the house. Um, anyway, the, uh, question I have is I got a new laptop recently. Um, and it's a Dell Inspiron 3793 and I'm running two monitors on it, but I'd like to add a couple more monitors. I'd like to have four monitors total, you know, the built-in monitor for the laptop plus three more. 
And I'm wondering the best way to go about doing that. Well, it's going to somewhat depend on the capabilities of the video card or the GPU in that laptop. Does it have discrete graphics or is it the Intel? It does have discrete gra graphics. Okay. But, um, you know, I was wondering whether I should... I've seen some of these, like, StarTech makes... Uh, a USB three. It's got a. It's extra honestly, you card. may you may end up having to do that. Uh, okay. So, you, for one thing, you're limited by the ports on the laptop. Now, you could get a dock. Yeah. Does the laptop it's have Thunderbolt on it by any? It does. It does not. Okay. It's a USB two USB three three point one Gen one ports. So the advantage of Thunderbolt is you could have one Thunderbolt cable. Get a dock, and you can have as many, almost as many monitors as you, as you want because Thunderbolt's yeah. so high speed. USB is a little bit more limited. You probably have an HDMI port on there, and that's it, right? Right. Yeah, I've got the HDMI uh, driving a second monitor already. Right. So it's these two more monitors. Two yeah. More. Yeah. There are a lot of USB monitors out there. Uh, AOC makes them. So there's some of them are very inexpensive, um, and the advantage of a USB monitor is, of course, it'll work. Uh, because uh, it's USB, and so right. it doesn't. It you know I don't I don't. There's still probably a limit to the number of pixels that Inspiron can push. That's really what it comes down to. Is yeah. You, know, you got. I, I don't need a. I don't need. Uh, I'm not gaming. I just want to be able to have more real estate. Yeah. Then you. Then speak. then I've I've had the USB monitors I've used. Are, Actually, surprisingly, I expected something kind of sluggish, and but no, they they actually can be quite good. So uh, I think that's probably the only way you're going to get three more monitors on that laptop is, is yeah. one HDMI and two USB monitors and, and two USB monitors. But but getting like this this external USB, uh, it's, it's, it's con video converter with external graphics card is the one that I'm lo looking. at. I don't at. think you I, you may not need that. And again, you should look at the specs. You should look at what Dell says. Uh, yeah. That would solve the problem, um, sort of. I mean, you're going to have to have some sort of driver on the machine that says, oh, we have an external GPU, uh, you need to drive that. And that's going to also right. be uh, something that this machine has to support. I'm sure this monitor comes with a driver to do that. Uh, so that's one way to do it. But honestly, you may just be able to drive uh, two USB monitors. I wouldn't get anything more than HD, you know, 1080p. Yeah. AOC, uh, a number of companies, Asus, AOC, AOC uh, and Asus both sell 15.6 inch 1080p monitors for around 150 bucks. Huh, that's um, bad. And and they're 60 hertz, they're full HD, decent uh, uh, response time. The Asus, which I think uh, John, you have the Asus, right? It's a port. It's a portable. It actually has a case, so you can fold it up and take it with you. Uh, it's 169 bucks, 75 hertz refresh rate. 1080p, 14 milliseconds, which is a very fast response time. That's a decent monitor, uh, okay. and um, you might you might even be able to use two of those. Uh, I would look in the you know you might have to go to the forums. Um, you know, Dell support will not know what the hell you're talking about in all likelihood. <laughs> but if you look at the yeah, specs, I, I looked at some of the forums and and it was the information was less than uh, helpful. Yeah, you got to find somebody who's tried it. I mean, if you buy it somewhere that you have return privileges. But yeah. three hundred bucks, two USB monitors—that's pretty nice. Well, okay, I actually, the, my only issue is that I already have two extra monitors, um, oh. which I bought off someone oh. who was moving and didn't want to move them. So that's why you I get it now. You're talking about an eGPU. I get it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I get it. So that's a di that's a different thing. So it, you, again, you have to have support for the eGPU and the hardware and the software. And it's it's an external graphics processing unit. And that, the eGPU unit, will have multiple uh, video ports, either HDMI yeah, or I'm, display ports. So, yeah, I'm looking at, a, a, I'm just on Amazon, right, looking at uh, from StarTech. And I bought StarTech stuff that seems to be pretty good. Um, and uh, this is a dual, which says it works on Macs or PCs. It's $136. It's got two, two HDMI ports out. Perfect. And it, it, Does it yeah. say what the graphics card is in it? Uh I'd have to go through the specs in here somewhere. I don't see it, but it does say it's uh, uh, adapter supports 4K at 60 hertz, and uh, display link okay. certified. Okay, and, that's good. I mean, it, it's less than buying a, a, a USB monitor. It's like yeah, and so you already have the monitors. Yeah, yeah. I haven't used that. Uh, I haven't used a Starlink, but you know they're. Uh, products we've I mean, used a number of stuff before a lot of these um a lot of these are built for gamers 
who want to use laptops, but they want to have a high-end discrete graphics for their games. So I'm familiar with uh, Razer makes one I've used, and it's very nice. Okay. Um, but it's a little more expensive. It's 300 bucks, And it probably, let me see if it includes the card for that price, come to think of it. It may not include the card. So, um, yeah, it does. That's 300 without the card. So it, so what you're looking at has its own GPU built in. Make sure it does. Some of these eGPUs are... Okay, good. Okay. Yeah, that's uh, that's that sounds fun. I'm not familiar with it, but it sounds like a... You, Something you, like that is the yeah. way to go. Something Absolutely. with an external Absolutely. video card. It's then you can drive 4K displays because you have extra horsepower outside. This is something relatively new. Uh, I've never seen any GPU used without Thunderbolt, however. So um, you're going to have some yeah, limitations that, with, the, with the... That was my biggest concern is that, yeah, it doesn't have Thunderbolt on it. And everything, I, I did do some reading and they said that USB, even USB 3 or 3.1 may not be fast enough to... Right to drive it. But again, I'm not doing, I'm not doing, but this, this USB Starlink drive. says it works with USB. It, it has a USB 3.1, uh, three USB 3.0 to dual display port adapter, 4k 60 Hertz display. Okay. Oh, now, now that's maybe not what you think it is. That okay. might be outbound. You, what you need is how do I connect this to the computer? Uh, I see what you're saying. That might be, you're right. You, uh, uh, so I've never seen an eGPU that doesn't use Thunderbolt 3. Not to say they don't exist, but, of course, they often have USB ports, but it's really the connection to the computer you're, you're looking at that you care about. Okay. So um, I'd, investigate, I'd investigate further. Let me, let me do my best homework, too, for you. But um, that could be just the outbound port. That could be just an extra USB port. You want to make sure it works with the computer. So Dell apparently does sell a dock. Let me look at that. This is the chat room. <sighs> Dell's docking station, USB 3. And that, uh, you know what? This is a better way to go. He's gone now, but I hope he's still listening. D3100, USB Dell docking station. Uh... Connects your laptop to up to three additional monitors, various external devices, and the internet with a single cable. Okay, this looks like the solution. High speed, it's a USB 3 dock. Nice. So it, it's USB 3 in, and then it has three. Well, that's odd. Are those, what are those ports in the back? They. Okay, so this is <laughs> three additional monitors, but that you must have to use USB monitors. Yeah, this may not be the solution for you. Oh, it's got two HDMI and a and a DP. Okay, so it does have a Display Port out. So okay, yeah, this will this will work. This will work. This might be, and guess given that it's from Dell, this might be a better way to go. Thank you, Irvine Rob. It's where I don't see the. Oh, that's the front. Where's the back? Ah, there's the back. Perfect. Perfect. So. You, this is Display Port, and these are HDMI. It's got Ethernet. Two and a USB and USB. So that's this is perfect. I bet you this is what you want. And there's an, apparently, uh, Irvine Rob says, a D6000 as well. A little more expensive. Any do laptop equipped with USB-C or USB 3.0 ports with a Dell Universal dock, up to 3, 4K. There you go. That's the solution. Let's put that in the show notes. Thank you, Irvine Rob. Thank you. That is absolutely the solution. Absolutely. Well, hey, 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 how are you today? Leo Laporte here, the tech guy. Time to talk about tech. Computers, yeah, sure. The internet, yeah, sure, you betcha. Punch cards, not so much. Smart watches, oh, yeah. Smartphones, yeah. Anything with a chip in it. 8888, ask Leo. 
Now that's taking talking to yourself to a whole new level. 888-827-5536. If you don't call, I will continue to talk to myself and that you don't want. Uh, if you're outside of the U.S. or Canada, you should still use that number, but just use some sort of internet doohickey and uh, like Skype and it, it should be toll free. Website where everything gets written. As it is spoken, so it shall be written at techguylabs.com by my official scribe. He, uh, he actually, yeah, he, he's putting it in clay tablets as I speak, James DeRuvo. And that's free. There's no sign up. Techguylabs.com. So you, if you hear something, you say, oh, I want, for instance, our last caller was uh, bought a Dell Inspiron, brand new, uh, doesn't have Thunderbolt. It only has one monitor port, an HDMI port, but he wants to run the laptop plus three monitors. And he was asking about a, uh, a eGPU of some kind. And I, we, thanks to the chat room, Irvine Rob in the chat room, great suggestion. Thank you, Irvine Rob. Dell, in fact, sells exactly what you need. It connects via USB 3 to any computer, including Dell's computers. It has uh, on the back two additional HDMI ports plus a display port. So easy, you can buy a display port to HDMI adapter. It's the same kind of data. It's just different different you know plugs on either end. So you get an HDMI to a, a display port adapter and you should be able to run three monitors with that just fine. And Dell sells it, which means I'm going to guess it probably works with the Inspiron. So that's in the show notes. Thank you, uh, Irvine Rob. Um... <laughs> 88, 88 ask Leo Rob's having fun in the chat room now Don and Victor Montana is next hello Don hello Leo thanks for taking another call from me and I appreciate listening to you every weekend I learn a lot of little tidbits yeah so that's basically it this is the little tidbit show basically yeah <laughs> The problem we've been having with two computers here started with my wife's computer a couple months ago, and then it started with mine. Is we use Google Chrome as our primary um, web searcher, and whenever it wakes up, like you turn the computer on the first time in the morning, or if it's gone to sleep during the day and you reactivate it, the page that is tabbed on the screen at that time is frozen. You cannot activate any point on that screen. You can't even shut it down with the mouse. You go over and click on a new tab, open a new tab, and everything instantly appears in that first tab. Ah! Figure out so the, oh. the browser, Chrome hasn't frozen, but that one page is just sitting there. Do, if you waited, if you were really patient and you just waited and waited, it would eventually become alive? No. It never does. <laughs> No. Never does. And if I try to, uh, for instance, usually I leave Gmail sitting out on a tab that's open. And if I go and try to activate Gmail again, it just turns to a white page. It doesn't function. Or if I uh, oh, so you try to recycle it, you know, the little circle with the arrow on it, it nothing happens. So, um, if you close the if you close the frozen tab, you can still use the browser, though, right or no? Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. So it's just that that old tab that was there before it went to sleep. Now is just sitting there, like a you know, a dead tooth. Wake up. Yeah, and and then but you can but the browser is still working, and you can close that tab and continue on. Right. So. This might be something Google's doing to you. Um, the way the way Google Chrome uses tabs, they're all uh, sandboxed, and there's there's a good reason for it because uh, many web pages, if you leave that tab open, it will continue to consume memory cycles. It'll work as long as it's open. For and furthermore, if it's got something on it that's that's malicious or just you know annoying, uh, like music. That will continue to happen, too. So tabs are sandboxed. They're isolated from other tabs and from your system. And furthermore, Google now has a thing called Tab Freeze, which came out in Chrome 79 Canary. You're on Chrome 80, I think. Where it, it, it freezes tabs that have been running in the background to free up memory. 
it just stops them. It halts them. And I'm suspecting that's what's happening. Now, you can turn that off. Um, uh, and it sounds like this is enough of annoyance that you might want to. But let me explain why they do that. Because, as I mentioned, those tabs can be running and using up resources and power and memory and all that stuff. But if you want to turn that off, it looks like you can turn it off in a fairly complicated fashion. Um, <laughs> uh, um, it should, you know, this was a pre-release feature in the last version of Chrome. It might be that they, that, you know, the other thing Google does, and a lot of, everybody does this now, uh, Microsoft does it too. They roll out features to small groups instead of everyone at once. So maybe you just got lucky. Congratulations. Don and you're now. How long has this been? How long has this been happening? About two months. Okay. That's just what I thought. It seemed to maybe have occurred with an update, but I yeah, I think it. I think it has. Yeah. Um. So there is a web. There is a uh, uh, something you can enter in the address that will show you what the status of the tabs is. So make a new tab. Keep that old tab frozen, and type. Chrome colon slash slash. You know, normally you do HTTP colon slash slash. Instead of doing that, say Chrome colon slash slash. And then type discards. These are called discarded tabs. D-I-S-C-A-R-D-S. -S. Okay. It's a suspended tab. And it will give you a list of tabs that are suspended right now. If the tab that is frozen is in that list, then I think we've discovered the cause. There is a way to turn it off, probably. Um, it, again, it's going to be another one of those Chrome colon slash slashes. Uh, the article I'm looking at, and I'm gonna, this is from Tech Radar. I'll put this in the show notes so that you can refer to it at techguylabs.com because it's a little complicated. But uh, I don't know if you know this, but Chrome, like many browsers, has a secret preferences window. And you get to it by typing Chrome colon slash slash flags and there and you when you do that you're going to see a whole bunch of stuff like all the th all the preferences you didn't know you could set they they hide this away every browser does this firefox colon slash slash has it uh, i think edge does it it's very common because there are many 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 more settings in any browser than you would ever want to show a, a, a human <laughs> so try try this it's Chrome colon slash slash flags, and then search for, there's a little search up at the top, because otherwise you, it's a long thing to type. But if you just search for tab freeze, tab dash freeze, you can see that setting, and you can turn that off if you want. You can, the, the, uh, the uh, you have it disabled or enabled. I'm, I'm not sure that's what's happening, but it sure sounds like it. I don't see this, but I think you are part of the experiment. <laughs> Congratulations. They dump stuff out of here in Montana that they want to buy. It's not, it's, not unusual. Uh, you know, they're always trying stuff, Google is. And, and it's not unusual that they'll try it on a small subset of all, overall users just to see if anybody complains. <laughs> <laughs> well, you are complaining. It, it, you know what? I would think people would complain because that's a bizarre behavior. Like you don't, ex you know, that's a dead tab, you know, and uh, and you and and there is something in that tab that you want. Is it your Gmail? Yeah, it, it'll do it to any tab. If it's if okay, any it. tab. All right, it may be a bug. If this if this doesn't show up and doesn't fix it, re you could reinstall Chrome and see if it if that fixes it. Because it might just be a bug. But it does sound an awful lot like this new feature that they're testing out, doesn't it? <laughs> uh, type, type Chrome colon slash slash discards and see if that tab is in it. That will tell you, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, it's doing it. And now, if, if typing that does nothing, then you don't have that browser. Then I have no idea. <laughs> it's, it's either a bug or a feature. Or, you know, in this case, maybe both. I love the Gypsy Kings. This used to be my theme song. <laughs> it's kind of a strange theme song, isn't it? It's not even in English. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. It's not even in Spanish, is it? It's like... Uh, K 
Catalunian or something, something strange. Leo Laporte, the tech guy, 8888, ask Leo. Rob Pyle, the space guy coming up. Lots to talk about. A, a middle-of-the-night splashdown. A flying helicopter on Mars. This is not sci-fi, folks. We are living in the future. But, meanwhile, Bruce in Las Vegas is next. Hello, Bruce. Hi, Leo. How are you? Fine. How about yourself? I'm feeling fine in a fine fettle. I'm in a fine I have a book. Fettle. I have a book recommendation oh, for, good. You for your audible. Yes. Um it is called Not All Fairy Tales Have Happy Endings. Oh. The Rise and Fall of Sierra Online. Oh Ken Williams. I really want to read that. It is fascinating of what happened to this company and i'll tell you what they were one of my favorite game producers of all time you have to kind of be an old timer to remember sierra online king's quest and and all of those these were in the days when uh that you know uh, most adventures were text adventures and they came up with graphic adventures and they were kind of you know in those days the graphics wasn't great but but if you grew up with sierra online adventures of course you have this soft spot in your heart uh I this is back in the 80s space quest space quest I, yeah yes with roger wilco uh that was one of my favorite games and of course leisure suit larry was just absolutely <laughs> awesome at the time i've interviewed al Lowe, the creator of leisure suit larry he's every bit as funny and weird as one would expect and of course the williams uh the williams is um were legendary uh, they were here in uh, the central California and uh, doing some amazing stuff. And oh, I, I didn't know there was a book about them. I will definitely listen to it. What's the name of it again? It's called Not All Fairy Tales <laughs> Have Happy Ending, The Rise and Fall of uh, Sierra Online. Okay, I'm, that's uh, adding that to my uh, Audible list. Uh, can't wait. Thank you for the recommendation. Well, yeah, it's important to me because they did a... Um, a um, flight sim called Red Baron. And yes. I had just bought a 286 <laughs> um, Packard Bell computer yes. when that came out. <laughs> but the thing about it was that my son at that time was having reading problems at school, and they called me up and told me they were going to back him down a grade. And this program, because it not only had the flight sim, but it also had all the biological uh, uh. biography about the pilots and about the planes. And my son was in six months at playing this. He wanted so much to learn about the planes and the pilots that he taught himself. And within six months, he was reading at almost a college level. This is where uh, a personal computer can transform. That is a wonderful story. And who would have thought? You know, you would have thought, oh, I'm going to buy educational stuff so, you know, so that he can learn. But no, you, you, a little spoonful of sugar makes the medicine go down. And uh, it was a fun game. And so he didn't even think he was learning how to read. He was just getting into it. Right, That's and wonderful. what was funny about it was that he used to uh, put it onto invincible mode, and then he'd fly <laughs> to the uh, enemy's drone, uh, air drone, land, and then shoot up all the planes uh, on the ground. And then he, when he got done, then he'd fly back up and back <laughs> to his own. It was funny, but he was he was that game and that company I owe so much to because That's my neat. son ended up teaching himself how to That's read. That's wonderful. Their materials. He is now uh, an, an adult. Does he still game? Oh yeah. Oh no, big time. In fact, he doesn't watch TV. He spends all his time on the computer uh, gaming. Nice. I've been doing that a lot lately. Instead of TV, I've been playing a Viking <laughs> in a game called Valheim, and I'm so addicted. My poor wife. I wow. said, honey, I've got to go dig a, dig a troll trench. I'll be back later, but I don't want the trolls to destroy my keep. And she's going, oh. Halo to come out. I'm oh, gonna that's going to be exciting. Halo. Yes. The new Halo. Yes. My question. Yes. Oh, yes. Let's get to that. that. Yes. Okay. Um, in the old days, when I was in high school, there was a company called Heath Kit. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I used to build kits that were sold by the school. And my first stereo system was a Heath kit that I built 
all the way through. Do you know if there's a company these days that um, sells kits like that for higher end? Because I'd like to build an AV receiver. Uh, this was, you know, so many geeks of our generation um, cut their teeth on Heath, Heath kits. In fact, some of us, uh, I, my college roommate built, he built a Heath kit computer. Uh, they're still around, believe it or not. Um, right. Yeah. Uh, I, I thought they were gone, too. Maybe they went through a little uh, financial hard times, but they still make Heath kits. I'm looking at some right now. I don't see an AV receiver, but uh, yeah, no, Heathkit uh, still exists, so Heathkit's back, baby. So that's good news. AV receiver kit. Th this is, by the way, I, I'm sure there are many people doing this now because, of, first of all, people of our generation grew up <laughs> on Heathkit. But also, thanks to the Raspberry Pi and other small, inexpensive computers, uh, there are companies like Adafruit at adafruit.com that sell kits to do all kinds of things. So I would uh, I would look around at the various companies that do this. I, Adafruit is my favorite. I, I just think they're the greatest, and I love the the, uh, the people who uh, run it. But there are many companies. But Heath gets still around. Uh, Adafruit, I wouldn't be surprised if they had a Raspberry Pi-based AV receiver. I'd certainly take a look at it. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Retcon, that's the best animated GIF ever. This is going to be the new Rod Pyle animated GIF. Look at that. Love that. Love that. Landing in tandem. That was so beautiful. Wasn't that? I, I, <laughs> I was practically in tears when I saw it. We watched that live while I was doing a show. and I, I was just like, Oh, did you? Yeah, I was like, Wow. I, I had to isolate myself at home with a glass of bourbon because I knew I was going to start blubbering if yeah. things worked. I was all it, blubbering. Yeah. It looked like the simulation. Hey, are the Williams brothers you're talking about the same one that used to do the um, the upright arcade games? No. No. Oh, okay. I know the Williams. No, this was Roberta and Ken Williams. They were a husband and wife team in, um, in uh, the Central Valley. And uh, they did Space Quest. They did uh, King's Quest. They did graphic yeah. adventures. Those yeah, you th w the Williams uh, pinballs and stuff. Yeah, that, I don't know. Uh, yeah. yeah, that's different. Because I used to have an Apollo 18 full-size upright uh, arcade game. Oh, fun. But it was pre-video, so it was chain drive. <laughs> oh, we crashed Heathkit. Oh. Oh. I can't believe they're still around. I thought they were long gone. I think that I think that you know they have a T-shirt that says Heath, Heath gets back. <laughs> so somebody <laughs> probably just bought the uh, yeah bought the name. Uh, at least it, it hasn't sunk to something like Bell and Howl. You see those oh, late night ads. Well, your, the guy was talking Bell about Bell and Howl playing thing, on his know? Packard Bell. That had nothing to do with a radio company, <laughs> Packard Bell. Packard Bell. I mean, does anybody under sixty even know what Packard? No, Bell is? that was the funny thing. They wanted to. It was a Chinese company that wanted to sell computers. They thought, well, if we call it Yao Ming Computers, they're not going to buy them. Let's call it Packer Bell. This will legitimize it, yeah. Yeah. It's like calling it Wolseley. Oh, actually, Wolseley did come back as electronics, didn't they? I take it back. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. It's time for our rocket man, Rod Pyle. He is the author of Space 2.0, uh, the man on the moon book, uh, what is that called? I always get the name wrong on that. Rod, tell me the uh, 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 first, first, first on the moon. First on the moon. Thank you. <laughs> you know, the reason I get it wrong is because I confuse it with that horrific Damien Chazelle movie, The First Man. And, and that was such a terrible movie about uh, Neil Armstrong that I, that I, you know, I, you know, I'm blanking it out. And and it was it could have been a great story, and the book was was very long and very detailed, but very kind of tone neutral, which was uh, Jim Hansen's, the author's sort of quest. And then here comes this movie, which, uh, you know, a couple of friends of mine consulted on, including Hansen, and they weren't entirely happy with it. But, you know, you see Armstrong stumbling around in this depressed funk, not I was talking so to angry for two and a half hours. At the end of the movie, I, was, I yeah. was, I went with a couple of kids and I said, young men, 
That is not the story. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> this man so is a hero. He is the Christopher Columbus of our time. He was the first human on the moon, and he was an amazing human being to boot, to focus on the fact that he didn't pay enough attention to his son so he could go to the moon is completely to miss the point. So anyway, I'm sorry. Not, yeah. not the first man. Don't watch that movie. <laughs> Read the book, The First on the Moon, by Rod Pyle, also editor-in-chief of Ad Astra magazine from the National Space Society. That was the longest intro you've ever gotten. Sorry about that. I got yeah, sidetracked. Yeah, but, 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 but good reason. I mean, yes. I, I saw that film. It was visually spectacular. It was all the stuff that many modern films are. Very, the effects are very done well. But this depressed, morose <laughs> Neil Armstrong, who hardly ever talked to anybody, the guy had an incredibly dry wit. He was very friendly. Yeah, he was quiet. But if you, know, if you listened to him and he was on the moon... He was like a kid in a candy store. They were yeah. jumping around having a great time. No. He wasn't trying spending, you know, two hours of moonwalk trying to figure out where to throw his daughter's death bracelet. I mean, oh, that was just man. Was, well, and that didn't happen anyway. And 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 yeah. my 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 son's friend uh, said, "I've never heard Leo swear." <laughs> <laughs> I was very, I was very angry uh, at Gold that. It. And even if Neil yeah. was depressed and was mean to his son, that's completely. I don't. That's not the point. He walked on the moon. All right. Anyway, go ahead. Well, there was two two wonderful yeah. space events to celebrate this week. Big stories. Yes. So this morning we had, uh, which apparently John watched as I did, the Crew One splashdown after six months in space, which was sensational. John, our Crew studio Dragon. engineer, is a space fanatic. How well, yeah. he got up? What is it? Three a.m. He got up to see that. It was uh, midnight our midnight. time. Midnight. Oh, well, that's Just not too bad. It. Okay. No, it wasn't too. I bad. I was actually up, but if I'd only known. What was cool, it was the first nighttime splashdown since Apollo 8 in 1968. So I thought that was pretty neat. Gulf of Mexico, which is a little easier to, to handle than the vast Pacific. Um, but the best thing, the best two things is, one, everything worked. And the other one was that they ended up in what they call stable one, which is pointy side up. If you're in stable two, the capsule's upside down floating and you're hanging from your straps. So we <laughs> not, all like stable one. Not, not, I'm surprised they even call that stable. That doesn't sound so stable. Well, stable it's... Two. it's NASA talk, you know, yeah, yeah. and so I'm listening to this and, you know, SpaceX was right on it. They had the recovery vessels out there and it's weird to see this private company doing that, right? Because it's yeah. all under contract. We grew up seeing, you know, the military out there doing all that. Nope, this is the SpaceX boats and the Capcom who's talking to the astronauts while they're bobbing around sounds like he's about 24. <laughs> and SpaceX and, cracks me up. I feel like I'm watching an MTV reality show when I'm watching their stuff. But what's weird is back in the day when they were doing the Apollo flights, the controllers weren't much older. The astronauts are oh, about 10 years it's older. It's us that got older. <laughs> but the flight controllers are in their late 20s. Oh, all right. <laughs> and They sounded know. old, though. Come on. Oh, they had that military. Yeah. Uh, you know, they sounded like you're They're all your trying to sound like Chuck your, Yeager. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Transcontinental flight. Yeah. Exactly. So it, so this was remarkable. I mean, it, the good thing, of course, about having Crew One comes home is there, there aren't 11 people on the space station anymore because they can spread out and have a little more space again. Because it really wasn't designed for that many. In a pinch, it can. But, you know, they kind of want the crew to be seven or eight people. That That's easiest to accommodate up there. But also, by keeping the uh, SpaceX Crew Dragon up there for six months, that also tests its ability to park and, and loiter and wait, you know, because you want to make sure this thing isn't going to go south on you while it's sitting there parked at the station. Then you start pushing buttons and, you know, it's like our, our old internal combustion cars. If you let them sit for six months, they don't want to start, right? So, um, so that was all good news. Yeah. They, did, they drained the oil, put it up on blocks, but, but it still works, which is good. Well, and and they'll use it again. So they've already reflown one of them. That's amazing, isn't it? That's amazing. <laughs> we never did that before. Right? No, it's a. Is it a big savings? I mean, do you do that to save money? Yes, I mean partly because it's Elon. He does that because it's because cool. he wants to. Right. Yeah. But but he is saving money. He's used one of his boosters, I think, ten times now, and uh, he's it saying, must save Look, money. Yeah, we think it, it may be better than we expect. That we'd be able to be able to use these things a hundred times. The reason I ask is, on. yeah, you don't have to build a new one, but it may cost almost as much to refurbish the old one. You can't just put it back in service. You got to fix it up. 
Well, that's kind of what happened with the shuttle. Refurbishment costs were very high and the flight rate was low. But with SpaceX, they're finding that refurbishment isn't that big a deal. But I think part of that's better technology and the fact that it's a simpler thing to do. It's just a know, tube. Coming back in a it's capsule. just a tube, really, right? Well, a, a gumdrop, yeah. But I mean, the nice <laughs> thing is you're coming coming in blunt end down, so you don't have to worry about tiles being shed like you did with the shuttle, and right. the engines are a more advanced design, right. so they don't have the, you know, the tiles was the problem with the shuttle. They had to have some sort of heat-resistant layer because it was reentering the, the atmosphere. Uh, and I know yeah. those fell off, and there were all sorts of... They had to inspect them. Early on. Yeah. yeah. I mean, they actually got much better, but a lot of it was the, the main engines. They were constantly right. swapping them out oh, from interesting. one orbiter to the next, oh, interesting. And blah, blah, blah. The capsule, anyway. if the astronauts are clean, they tidy up after themselves when they leave. It's, it's just a fresh coat of paint, and you're ready to go. Empty the ashtray, throws it off, and <laughs> off you go. Empty the ashtrays, <laughs> I love it. Now, that's not the only big news this week. We are nope. in a wonderful time, folks. The helicopter ingenuity, what a success. Did it again. So fourth flight, April 30th, uh, first three, fl three flights, they accomplished everything that they had set out for their fairly modest goals for this. So it's can you go up, can you come down, can you go sideways, can you go away from us, can you come back? So it was really kind of like a, a game controller, right? You just want to make sure it performs all those basic functions. Up, down, left, and right, A, pictures. B, A, B, start. Everybody knows. Yeah. 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 So now they've done the fourth flight, and they went uh, more than twice as far, went more than twice as fast. And then after that was over, at the sa about the same time, within a couple of days, the crew for the Perseverance rover said, you know what, there's some interesting stuff right where we are. We're going to stay here for another month. So you helicopter guys can keep playing with that thing. So they got a one-month extension. Awesome. And might get up to seven flights. But then eventually the rover's got to drive away and bye-bye helicopter because it can't communicate anymore. The, but well, they well, did Can't the double. helicopter just follow the rover? Well, you'd think, but for some reason they've decided not to do that. Okay. They're just it, not going to extend it's, the mission. The ingenuity was done. really a proof of concept. It wasn't yeah. intended to be a big mission. It was just to see if it would work at all. And the good news is it worked with flying colors, literally. Well, no, I don't so know. So to speak. In yeah. color, yeah, but yeah. So and it was in color. I mean, the navigation <laughs> camera wasn't, but but the the side camera, thirteen yeah. megapixels, look great. This is the other thing we talked about this last week. The images we get from this now, I guess NASA and SpaceX and everybody else realizes half the job is PR. You got to get yeah. the folks back home to get excited about this. So the images are stunning. They're almost too good, aren't they? It's like you look at it. Oh, you don't, think, don't say that. that you're going to start a whole conspiracy theory <laughs> thing. No, no, I don't mean that way. I mean, it's like it takes a little bit of the mystery out of it. Yeah. Because I, you know, we came up during the Viking era when the pictures were a little fuzzy yeah. and a little, no, no. Mars a little too Mars orange. Mars looks like Nevada. It's, it's really what it looks yeah. like. Yeah. The and these rovers keep landing in <laughs> things that look like Walmart parking lots, you know? Rod Pyle, space guy, author, space 2.0, editor in chief at Astra. Always a pleasure. Thanks, Rod. Have a great Thank you, sir. week. We'll see you next time. You too. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. That's cool. That's so cool. So I have a long-standing question. Yes. The baseball bat. Oh, everybody asks about that. It's, yeah, is it's, that for it, the, when the zombies come or was yeah. just a, something you I probably should fondly. take it down. It's a Louisville slugger that somebody gave oh. me on the, uh, on the occasion of, and this is what cracks me up, Twit's <laughs> 100th show. We are now at 821. Yeah. So I probably should retire that. Maybe they'll maybe I'll put another O on it in a couple of years, but uh, yeah. your numbers are just just <laughs> sky high. It's amazing to me. And I say, oh, show nine thousand four hundred seventy seven, and I think this is productivity. At so best. we're talking to somebody who's going to do um, an AI voice thing, where uh, they can simulate my voice with anything. When they copy, you know, you could read something and then put my voice on it. It would sound like I'm reading it. Yeah. And the uh, and the, one of the reasons they want to use me is because, well, there's about 100,000 hours of Leo talking. I don't know the actual. <laughs> Patrick could probably tell me the actual number. But yeah. uh, so they got plenty of material for their um, training. So we'll see. When, if they ever do well, it, I'll, I'll play it. When that comes out, I'm going to use it to call the leader of North Korea to <laughs> cut it out. Hello. Let's Leo just says, Richard just Nixon. knock it off. <laughs> yeah. uh, 
Rod Micah says, get the Audio Technica ATR 2100X. <laughs> You'll be so much happier. I know. Well, I've got a sure SM7B. It's just it, it like I said, that's it's a, a very good one. Haul back and forth. Don't worry about it. Yeah. The Yeti's fine. You're it's it is I think it got blown, to be honest. And this is when one you of say the blown. You mean so, like damaged? Yeah. No. Yeah. I just got it like two months ago. Turn the gain. Are you playing with the gain knob on it? And uh, I am now. Turn it down. Turn it down. Okay. Turn it down. Okay. I'm keep going. Turn it some more. Turn it down some more. There, that's much better. Oh, good. Oh, well, and, and that, turn it down a little more because when you went, oh, good. <laughs> well, I I was picking it, it up. It I was wondering again. which which pattern I should be on on the back. A uh, cardioid, the heart shape pattern, the upside yeah, down heart. I got that one. That's more right. directional. Okay. Yeah. Um, but the main thing is play, and you talk into the logo, right? You know that, right? Yeah, right to the side. That's not the problem. It's just clipping. I think turning it down fixed it. Turn it in just a nudge more. Down, right? Yeah, yeah. Check, 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 check. Yeah, that's good. Now you're much oh. better. I think it was just overdriving. Wow, it's almost down to zero. <laughs> yeah, condenser mics are super sensitive. This is why I generally yeah. tell, and that, that's why the Shure is so great, and that's why I use uh, you know dynamic mics on, oh, our, uh, yeah. on our shows, because condenser mics are very, very sensitive. Uh, they're easily blown, but I don't think you did blow it. I think mm. it just was overdriven, so I think you're okay. Sounds much better. Oh, great. So don't get the uh, don't get the uh, don't get the audio technica. You're good. You're good, man. Thank I you, Rod. I did just just for laughs. I bought one of those twenty dollar look alike condenser mics on Amazon from some no name company, and it's blue and gold and all that. And I mean, they actually they make sound. It's not great, but they actually they make do some work. sound. Remember in the uh, old days of PCs, you'd get a thing on a stick. Yeah, <laughs> that was the mic, and it was. Uh, I'm, I'm talking to you off of my uh, computer. Yes. How do I sound? It was terrible. It looked like a surgical probe, but yes. <laughs> won't go oh, there. Maybe that's what it was for. <laughs> Thank you, Rod. Have a wonderful you. week. We'll talk next week. Take care. Take care. Show's not over. What are you doing to me, Leo Laporte, the tech guy? I'm just getting started here, but I, I see we're almost out of time. Thank you. A deep, heartfelt thank you to Professor Laura, our musical director, who provides you with the interludes. She's the, uh, she's the Paul Schaefer of this show out there in the back. She, you didn't know this, but those are all cover songs. She's playing all the songs. She is. Also, thanks to Kim Schaffer, our, uh, our phone angel. She's the one putting you on the air, getting your cow link pasted down for your appearance on national radio. Thanks to all of you, especially, for calling in and for listening in. Um, couldn't do it without you, actually, quite literally. So uh, thank you for letting me be myself once more. Your geek on the radio. Mario in San Diego, Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hi, Mario. Hello, Leo. How are you doing? I'm well. How are you? Oh, I'm good. Uh, uh, very well, but a little confused. I just recently picked up an HP computer. Yeah. Uh, it's got everything. It doesn't come with disk or anything. You just fill out and log in. Anyway, look here. After I've logged in and set this up, while I'm still going online and I'm doing something online and filling out something, I constantly get these pop-ups no! coming up right now. I'm filling out forms. And I'm just wondering, how do I get rid of Can I get rid of this? How do I get rid of this thing? So... Uh, sometimes it's confusing that I'm filling out something and suddenly I got a pop-up and it seems to be relevant here and I'm filling out that and I'm off track. Yes, it's worse than confusing. So, it's malware and it can be used to capture your passwords and other things. This is something you want to fix. Now, let me ask you, this computer, somebody gave it to you? No, I just bought it brand new it's, from Costco. You bought it brand new uh, and, and you had the pop-ups from day one? Uh, yeah, from after I fill it out, I constantly get these here. Well, it could be that whoever made, who made, who, 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 what brand is it? This is HP. Oh, you said HP. You know, the old days, HP was notorious for putting a lot of junk on their computers, but they don't put pop-ups on there. I think you're infected. Windows, with Windows 10. Yeah, I think you're infected. So... You know, you've gone to a site that had malware on it, and it's in your system, and those pop-ups, are they um, suggesting you do things and buy things, and are they ads? What oh, yeah, kind? That, that, too, a lot of ads and yeah. stuff like that. I know I filled out 
some forms on the Wheel of Fortune and all that stuff. Oh yeah. So those some of those sites you visited uh, definitely uh, did more than just uh, play Wheel of Fortune. So you've got go you got junk on your system. This is very unfortunately very common, and one of the reasons I tell people don't buy a Windows machine, please. But you've done that. That's okay. It's not your fault. You didn't. You know, it's not your fault. They're selling them. They shouldn't do this. Well, I thought I had a private network here. I'm just wondering. You're on the internet. It ain't private. You're on the internet. It ain't private. As soon as you go on the internet, welcome to the bad world. Uh, so, so there are a couple of things you can do at this point. There are a couple of things you can do. Uh, I'm concerned more about your security than the annoyance. I mean, certainly the annoyance factor is high, but the security is even a bigger issue. For instance, let's say you're uh, you're on your bank site. You're logging in because you want to see, you know, uh, you want to pay some bills. Yeah. The pop-up can pop up right on top of the bank login and capture your login and then go away. And you go, oh, I thought I logged in. And you do it again. But now the bad guys know how to get into your bank account. That's not good. Uh, we want to fix we, we want to fix this yeah. we want to fix this so you didn't get a disk with this computer but did did you get a recovery no. i bet you got a recovery partition if you haven't yeah. used it long enough that you've got data on there that you need uh if you do well you want to back this data up because there is in windows a way to reset the operating system to kind of Fix it. This is the best way to get rid of all this stuff, but it's going to erase everything and it's going to start as if you got you just bought the computer. So uh, if you hit the, the funny little Windows key and you type reset, you'll see the menu item reset this PC. And what it's going to do, it's <laughs> and Microsoft has a good sense of humor. This is what it says. If your PC isn't running well, it's not. Resetting it might help. This lets you choose to keep your personal files or remove them and then reinstalls Windows. So do that. Again, Windows key to get the get the control panel. It's a set, it's in the settings menu. There's a reset this PC. It's under recovery. Press the get started button. If you the first time you do it, save your data. Just to, you know, so you don't have to back it up and to make sure. Again, I'd have a backup just in case, but save your data and see if that fixes it. It may not. It may be you want to wipe the whole thing and start with the same version of Windows that it came home from the factory with. I suspect you're going to need to do that. Then the next thing you're going to do is you're going to put some security software on there. And I'm not talking about the McAfee or the Norton that it came with. In fact, get rid of that. Microsoft has some pretty good security software. But what I'm talking about is put some blockers on your browser. If you're uh, using Edge which is the default uh, uh, browser on Windows these days. It's Microsoft's Edge. Um, you're going to want to get a, an add-on for an ad blocker. Um, my favorite, which is uBlock Origin, is unfortunately not available on Edge. Oh, it is. Sorry. That's good news. So th write this down. This is what you want on your computer. uBlock, U-B-L-O-C-K, space origin this is free it's in the microsoft store so you open the store on windows the windows store and you get you block origin on there that is not only going to disable pop-ups from websites it's also going to block a lot of semi-malicious things you know it's ostensibly an ad blocker but really what it is is it's a bad behavior blocker you've already got an antivirus microsoft provides one on windows 10 so you don't need a third-party antivirus that's why i said get rid of mcafee and norton that doesn't it doesn't add your security. It just slows your system down. So get rid of those. They do they do their own pop ups. By the way, uh, I would do I would do the factory reset because if you've got some malware on the system, sometimes it's not malware. It's adware. You know, it's not technically malicious. But I think anything that's annoying you to this degree is malicious. But resetting your PC will probably get rid of this. Uh, and again, there's two levels. There's the easy reset which doesn't wipe out your data but if that doesn't do the job do the real reinstall windows as if i just bought this computer since you just bought it chances are that's the best thing to do anyway and then put uBlock origin on your browser it's free it's very good it's very reliable gore hill the guy who writes it does it as a public service i think that's going to help you a lot um 
I don't, I'm hoping you didn't get infected. I think you probably most likely just got some, what we call, <laughs> with a certain amount of tongue in cheek, browser helper objects, BHOs. What they're helping the browser do is give you ads you don't want. So I would, my, my recommendation is let's get rid of that stuff. That is annoying. And it can be more than annoying. It can be dangerous. Uh, let's see. Uh, is there anything happening uh, in the next week that I'll be reporting in on? I might, I think, I'm hoping, get my air tags. I see people are starting to get them. There's some concern about how people could use air tags to spy or stalk somebody. Um, I will test that out and I'll have a report for you next week if I get my air tags. Of course, we'll answer all your questions too, as we do every week. Thanks to Lady Laura, Professor Laura, the musical director, to Kim Schaffer. Thanks to you for uh, letting me do this show. I don't, I've been doing this for so long, I don't know what I'd do if I couldn't do it. So I'll tell you what, let's make a deal. Let's get back together next week and we'll answer your questions. We'll talk about tech. You and me, okay? Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Have a great Geek Week. Bye-bye. Well, that's it for the Tech Guy Show for today. Thank you so much for being here. And don't forget, TWIT, T-W-I-T. It stands for This Week in Tech, and you'll find it at twit.tv, including the podcasts for this show. We talk about Windows on Windows Weekly, Macintosh on Mac Break Weekly, iPads, iPhones, Apple Watches on iOS Today, Security and Security Now. I mean, I can go on and on and on. And, of course, the big show every Sunday afternoon, This Week in Tech. You'll find it all at twit.tv. TV. And I'll be back next week with another great Tech Guys show. Thanks for joining me. We'll see you next time.